Okay, we're going to call the meeting of October 9th to order. Will you please stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will you call the roll, please? Councilmember Barnwell? Here. Falcone? Here. Horton? House? Here. Schneider? Here. Williams? Here. Mayor Bloom? Here. Item number one, proclamation declaring October 8th through 14th, 2007 as Harbor and Seafood Festival Week. The Santa Barbara Channel offers a rich marine maritime history and Santa Barbara Harbor is the home to many ocean related businesses and activities including commercial fishing. An annual free admission festival acknowledging Santa Barbara Harbor's contribution to the community has become an honored tradition. A harbor and seafood festival benefiting the Page Youth Center will take place from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Santa Barbara Harbor on Saturday, October 13th. The festival will feature an albacore barbecue, boiled crab and lobster boil, uh, marine exhibits, maritime information booths, live music, arts and crafts, um, raffles, children's activities, goes on and on, Built boat rides, tours of a NOAA research vessel and a Coast Guard vessel, seafood cooking demonstrations and a day-long fisherman's market. Participation by the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum will include free admission to the museum, guided museum tours, maritime films, a treasure map activity, and maritime crafts. So I proclaim the week of October 8th to 14th as Harbor and Seafood Festival Week and invite attendance to the day-long festival at the harbor on October 13th to celebrate this occasion and to support the Page Youth Center. And we're glad you're here. There you go. Mayor and Council, thank you very much. I'm Bob Yost. I'm the Executive Director of the Page Youth Center. And on behalf of all the kids that we serve, I want to thank you and particularly thank the Waterfront Department for this great event. It helps us throughout the year. We service about 3,000 children. Close to 30% of those come from the city of Santa Barbara. So we service the whole community, and it's really appreciative. This event, as we've watched over the last six years or so, has become a good community event. You hear people talking about it. Most of you have been down there. Some of you have been down there eating, dancing, and having a great time. Uh, and it's just a wonderful event. Our kids go out and participate and volunteer. Uh, we'll have probably 50 kids there volunteering and cleaning the place and selling tickets and doing all kinds of stuff. So it is a wonderful event for the city. We have, John has a little presentation here. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, members of council, John Bradley, waterfront director. Oh, that's um, pretty. Oops, I hang myself. <laughs> <laughs> This year we actually went back to our traditional Harbor Seafood Festival poster. Uh, we uh, hired Janice Blair to create the image, uh, which you see here today. Uh, she will be selling these on um, Saturday. There's 200 signed prints that will be available. She'll be there herself signing uh, the prints and selling them. Proceeds don't necessarily go to her. They'll be part of our overall fundraising effort as, as part of the festival. But this one is yours. Uh, oh. we, we had it framed. We're going to give it to Mayor and Council and hang okay. it proudly. And we hope to see you all there on Saturday if you're available. And just as you... Uh, <laughs> He's calling dibs on it already. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, I'll let it you guys work fight, like fight over it. <laughs> but the other thing I'd like to mention, um, today uh, Mick is... She's the mayor, I, man. She gets dibs. <laughs> uh, Mick is Sorry. having his uh, kidney transplant today, so your oh, thoughts oh. and prayers should be with him, or he well, would be here. Positive uh, thoughts, okay. Uh, on behalf. Very good, very good. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Laurie, you want to? Oh, he's going to put it right down there. Janice Blair is a very good artist who's done some other things in town too. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll see you on Saturday. John, would you please give Mick all our best? Yeah. Speedy recovery. Yeah. Okay, changes to the agenda? There are none, Madam Mayor. Okay, then we have public comment, starting with Robert Hansen. Ty trying to disguise yourself, Bob, as Robert? <laughs> I guess so, followed by Kenneth Locke. We're very formal today. Well, I'm trying to get the gay Mexican vote today, so... <laughs> 
You're I entertaining. Hanging, I was hanging on Haley last night, and it's hard. You know, the guys clean that area up. Nothing happening down there anymore. So I'm, sorry. I'm here at the podium trying to get that vote. Uh, my name is Bob Hansen. I'm running for Santa Barbara City Council. And I asked the attorney, Steve Wiley, <laughs> could I sit there and say that since this is a polling place, right? Can I say vote for Bob Hansen? Come on, you guys, vote for Bob Hansen. It's a polling <laughs> place here. Vote for me. Bob, you're supposed to address us up here. So you got to get us to vote so for So anyway, you. my complaint is... I probably don't have that much time for my complaint, <laughs> but it is the news press and the TV guide. If you look in the TV guide, a lot of times you don't see Channel 17 listed or 21. And those are the ones that are supposed to be broadcasting some information. The city took that on this year. So that needs to be done. I think next year or next time there's an election in, you know, uh, four or five years. That's what we're going to vote for. Uh, three years. Um, let's see. That needs to really be rectified so that people can see that maybe a couple of weeks before the absentee ballots come out. Instead of what it is now, it's real close. And those absentee ballots could be 50 votes. And I really don't want Santa Barbara to turn out what happened in Goleta. And that could happen here. And you know what happened there? Some of those people got on our city, on the city council out there. And that could happen here. And those people are those people. There are developers and pro growth, and there's three slates happening right now. There's the slate here of the city incumbents. There's the slate of the other three, and there's a two-person slate. Uh, and that slate is Daniel Litton and myself. He's a doctor, and we're working together, and we're trying to talk about issues, and that's what it's all about. So get out and vote, and I think next time we really need to make sure that we have that. And, and even now, this coming week, is Channel 17 and Channel 21 going to show that, you know, those uh, events are happening that we're speaking to people. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Ken Locke will be followed by Wayne Scholes. My name is Kenneth Locke. Um, I have a sign that I have on my bike. Um, it's kind of, a lot of people are looking at it, kind of looking at it. And uh, it's a uh, why bother? Um, I'm kind of been promoting a renaissance, a renewal, uh, another age of enlightenment and um, I'm here to say that it actually happened when I became enlightened back uh, a dozen years ago maybe even 15 now and um, but right now we have to understand that uh, that pretty much the relationship that this community has with reality um, I'm sorry to say doesn't have a foundation to base itself and uh, ultimately what is being done what actually historically has taken place here and continually until it it, um, it enters into this next age is um, better off it was never done and um, the reason why we have uh, the problems with this, in this community is um, kind of the byproduct of, of this uh, lack of realization uh, coming to terms with um, all I'm doing is just uh, trying to inspire some people the um, there are some people uh, that, like accountability um, that I'm gonna be putting some people in check and they're, they're pretty much the intelligent people they're the people who actually uh, can understand what I'm talking about. Um, the people who don't understand what I'm talking about, we, we can't hold them accountable. <laughs> it's kind of funny. How can you blame for some, somebody for, uh, that doesn't know that they're actually what they're doing? Again, does not add up to anything, and it actually is destructive to the community as well as the environment, uh, dot, dot, dot. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking for the parks. Uh, actually, I'll be speaking for the school board and kind of, Questioning them and uh, their understanding of the connection between tennis and like yoga. I actually have a video, and if you go onto YouTube and you put tennis yoga in there, I'm actually sharing knowledge in relation to the difference between those two uh, relationships. There is a difference. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Wayne Scholes will be followed by Eva Enbar. Hi, my name is Wayne Scholes, and I'm here to talk about a subject that I've already talked to several of you on the City Council about. And I'm sure uh, the people that are watching this program have either witnessed this or had this experience firsthand. And that's the lack of effort by some of the Santa Barbara Police Department to enforce the laws that are on the books in Santa Barbara. And I'm going to give three quick examples. Uh, two of them, all of these are going to occur up at Shoreline Park, where I've been active in trying to uh, get safety measures put in place to uh, control speeding and uh, make pedestrian safety better. Twice, once last year and just last week, we've had instances where people are riding motorcycles in the park, on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and on the grass. 
Last year, they almost ran down my neighbor's family. He jumped in front of the motorcycle to protect his four-year-old daughter from getting run over. When the woman that was riding the motorcycle tried to take off, my neighbor grabbed the keys so she couldn't leave. When the police came out, there were four police and a city park ranger. They basically threatened to arrest my neighbor for uh, kidnapping because he impeded her movement, never issued a citation to the motorcycle. The motorcycle was not registered. The person riding the motorcycle did not have a motorcycle license. And it's against the law to ride any motor vehicle in the park. The other instance was just last week, three motorcycles and an ATV were riding on the sidewalk and in the grass. Myself and another person who was uh, down the park farther called the police. These people luckily stuck around because they parked there after they were through riding on the sidewalk and on the grass. They parked their motorcycles broadside on the sidewalk, four vehicles, for over an hour, which forced everybody, parents with little kids in strollers, senior citizens with walkers, to walk around them just so they could take pictures of their motorcycles. This was not a professional shoot. When the police finally arrived, Officer Andury talked to him for about one minute, then he came over to me because he knew I was the one that made the complaint. When I asked him why he didn't cite him, he told me it was none of my business and did I have any ID. So I showed him my ID and he wrote my ID down. He didn't bother to get the ID of the people that are committing the violations. Later on, he told me the reason he didn't write him a ticket is he didn't feel like it. I asked him that the reason why he didn't write because he was standing right in front of a city sign that says that it's against the law to have motor vehicles there. The third incident happened a week and a half ago where there was a certified event there, and it was a rehearsal dinner for a wedding. It was a large party, and they had it catered. But the caterer, instead of having his barbecue trailers up on the grass with maybe plywood underneath them so it wouldn't affect the grass, he had a better idea. He decided to take the handicap parking. He parked his barbecue trailers all day in the handicap parking, denying handicapped people access to that park. Anybody that's ever worked with the elderly knows when you force an older person to step up on the curb, they can lose their balance and fall backwards and be injured. All the things I'm talking about, are concerns for public safety. One of the people that's handicapped that uses that space all the time called the police. When the police showed up, the officer asked him, how much longer are you going to be there? The caterer said about an hour, hour and a half. He said, okay, and left. Evidently, the police department, some of the officers in the police department feel it's okay for caterers to park their barbecue trailers in handicapped parking. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And the person you have to blame for allowing officers to do that is the chief of police. Cam Sanchez is the one that's in charge of all of these officers. And it's ridiculous that he can't get them to enforce laws on the books. He's also, it's ridiculous that the city of Santa Barbara thought he was going to be a, such a great chief that we gave him $500,000 starting at a 2% loan to buy a home so he would take the job here in Santa Barbara. Okay. For me, the lack of response by some of the police officers and the fact that Cam Sanchez pulled that little shenanigans to get a loan for a house proves to me that crime does pay. Unfortunately, it's paying for Cam Sanchez. Okay. I think what Santa Barbara needs Thank to you. do in the council is tell the chief, if you can't control your officers, we'll find another chief of police, we'll find him inside the department, and you can pay back your loan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Eva Enbar will be followed by Betsy Kramer. And then the last speaker will be Jane Brown. Didn't see Jane. Thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council. Uh, I'm Eva Inbar with the Coalition for Sustainable Transportation, or COAST. And I'm here this afternoon because I've been very troubled and upset by the recent spate of um, pedestrian collisions here in Santa Barbara. Within a week, we've had three serious injuries and one death. It's just too much. Uh, now, I know this city has done a lot of good things for pedestrians in the past. You've had State Street redone in the 60s, and that was visionary at that time. And you've had the um, circulation element in the 90s. That also was visionary. 
You now have the pedestrian master plan, and that's a very good document. All these things are in place, but we can't sit still. We have to work on these issues all the time. So there may be new things coming up. For example, the idea has been floated again to close State Street off to vehicular traffic entirely. I know people weren't ready in the past. Maybe they are now. These things have to be discussed again, I think, so that is one of the ideas I want to put out here. Also, the uh, uh, issue of vehicle speeds throughout the downtown. Um, it's really uh, the feeling of many people that there shouldn't be any speeds greater than 25 miles per hour in the downtown core. And I know this also is a complex issue. It's not easy to do, but I think it, look, it should be examined and looked into with staff and the appropriate people. Also, Cliff Drive, where this latest fatal accident happened last Friday, uh, I know there's a redesign uh, um, project for that. When the city takes it over, I don't know where we stand with it, but let me tell you, Cliff Drive needs it. I was out there today where this uh, young woman was hit in near pier, and there's a sidewalk. It's four feet, 11 inches wide to the curb, exactly, from the wall to the edge of the curb. And right next to it, there's all this traffic. There's no buffer zone. It is actually considered so dangerous that McKinley school children aren't allowed to walk there, although that is the shortest route for some of them. So this is what we're dealing with here. There are a lot of issues still out there to be addressed. So I'm asking you to consider putting together a pedestrian safety task force with some of your very competent staff, some of the pertinent city com committees, and grassroots organizations such as ours, as COAST. And on that note, COAST will be embarking on a major pedestrian project starting early next year. In January 2008, we will start Walk Santa Barbara. We're working on a major grant from a local um, a family foundation, Green Park Foundation, and we will have a full-time staff person on that. So we can do really serious work here, and we ask you to consider us as a partner in these endeavors. So we look forward to working with you with, on this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, Betsy Kramer will be followed by Jane Brown. Good afternoon. I'm here to tell you uh, about a very pleasant event. Uh, it's Lights Out Santa Barbara. It's an energy-saving, conservation awareness event that will take place on October 20th from 8 to 9 p.m. And we are inviting everybody's support, everybody in the council, everybody in the city. We have a website, um, lightsoutsb.org, for which you can get further information. And um, we are working very hard at it. And I should say we're totally grassroots. Uh, we have no committee. There are no meetings. Uh, there's no organization. We're just several people just trying to raise awareness of this. It's going to happen also in San Francisco and in Los Angeles. And um, we've heard no objection whatsoever to it, which is really kind of interesting. Um, and in fact, people say, well, uh, who could object? And I guess the only objection that would come would be people saying, uh, somebody could say, well, it's so little. How can you do anything on global warming or on energy conservation just by turning out your lights for an hour? Well, I've posted um, a link on, my web on, on our website to a parable given by Wangari Matai. She learned in Japan. And it's about a forest fire. It's probably a fire as large as our Zaka fire. And all the, all the animals were fleeing from the fire. And they're losing their homes. The trees were burning. And they were absolutely powerless. And they all were saying to each other, well, what can we do? We can't do anything. And one little hummingbird took off, and it began flying, flying, flying to the little stream. And it picked up a drop of water, flew back to the fire, back and forth, back and forth. And all the large animals began to laugh and said, yeah, you're not accomplishing anything. And the little hummingbird said, I'm doing the best I can. And that's what we think on this, this effort, that if we all get together, we, in fact, can accomplish something. And we look forward to your support. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Jane Brown will be the last speaker. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I was going to speak about something else, which I'll get to, but I was so inspired by the last speaker <laughs> talking about what we can all do. Um, first of all, I should say I'm Jane Brown with Southern California Edison. Um, and you're absolutely right. Doing things like that is really an awareness. It makes people aware that every time they flip on that switch, they are expending energy. And do they really need to do that? Um, but I wanted to tell you, but I'm also hoping that teachers and students will be watching a broadcast of this, um, about the Edison Challenge. I want to encourage them to participate. It is a program created by Edison and USC Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies. And what it is is that student-teacher teams um, will be challenged to create projects focusing on an area of environmental science to compete for great prizes. Participating teachers are also invited to attend series of um, science cur curriculum workshops for professional development. Project topics must be based on the theme of energy and the environment and should include one or more of the following environmental sciences. Energy transfer, energy conservation and energy efficiency, environmental protection and sustainability, renewable energy short resources so that we don't have shortages, <laughs> air and water quality, and alternative uh, transportation. Um, those who are eligible are teachers and students in middle and high schools. First place is a full week to the USC Wrigley Marine Science Center on beautiful Catalina filled with a week of SSK science, snorkeling, and kayaking. Mm -hmm. And second place is a four-day field day uh, field study expedition to Edison's Big Creek, which is our hydroelectric facility in the high Sierra, Sierras. Last year, I thought it was particularly special that Compton, a group from Compton, which mm -hmm. is an area that sometimes um, is underprivileged, I thought that was very special that they put the, the yeah. best project together last year, but <clears throat> now it's Santa Barbara's turn. So. <laughs> um, the program dates, you can start registering October 15th. And for more information, go to sce.com slash Edison Challenge. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. No more uh, speaker slips. We will go to the consent calendar. I have some people that would like to be uh, to take number four off. Any others? Lori, go ahead and read what you need to by title only. Okay. <clears throat> Item number three, introduction of ordinance for grant of easement to Caltrans for the realignment of State Route 192 onto a portion of Parma Park, including recommend recommendation A, that council introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the council of the city of Santa Barbara accepting a contract offer in the amount of $32,500 for a grant of highway easement to the state of California acting by and through the State Department of Transportation for the realignment of State Route 192 to be located on a portion of city-owned property known as Parma Park, assessor's parcel number 0211300003, and authorizing the city administrator to ex execute the same. Item number four, Institute for Local Government Communities for Healthy Kids, recommending that council adopt by reading of title only, a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara in support of the Institution for Local Government Communities for Healthy Kids program. Item number five, Transportation Manager's Salary Rate Correction, recommending that Council adopt by reading of title only. A resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara, amending resolution number 07-053. The Position and Salary Control Resolution for the fiscal year 2008, affecting the salary of the Transportation Manager and the Public Works Department, effective July 8, 2006. Okay. Without objection, we'll waive further reading. Um, item four had to do with the Institute for Local Government Communities for Healthy Kids, and I know uh, Roger Horton really wanted to be here. He got jury duty, so he's over there right now. Um, but he has been working hard on on the child and children and uh, youth committee that we have, and, and uh, he wanted to pull this off and have um, our parks and recreation people talk about this. So we have Sarah Hanna here right now who will tell us a little bit about this. Good afternoon, Mayor Bloom and council members. Thank you for this opportunity to show support for this resolution. Um, we all know how important it is to have healthy children. It keeps our families healthy and our community healthy, and it, go, it expresses itself in so many levels. And we do appreciate that Councilmember Horton brought this opportunity forward to us 
um, while sitting on the first five committee, learned of its initiative and uh, thought back to us about how our city could help support it. And with the community centers that we have and the outreach that we do for this particular um, income and social uh, level in our, in our neighborhoods, um, we, we understood immediately how important this could be. It's really a, a unique opportunity to link our residents to uh, insured health care for their children. And I have here today uh, Tara Dooley from the County Education Office. Tara is a, the Community, excuse me, Children's Health Initiative Program Manager. And she's going to explain a little bit more about why this is so important for the City of Santa Barbara. Great. Hi. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to sure. speak to you about it. The Children's uh, Health Initiative of Santa Barbara County was formed in 1999 when Santa Barbara was, uh, County was identified as having the highest percentage of uninsured children in the state of California. At that time, it was 14.7 percent. And now in the uh, 2005 Children's Health Insurance Survey conducted by UCLA, we were designated as number two, as having the second highest percentage of uninsured children. So we call it the dubious distinction. And in Santa Barbara City itself, we estimate that that 14.1 percent is about 2,500 children within the city limits of Santa Barbara that are uninsured. The Institute for Local Government's initiative called the Communities for Healthy Kids uh, was brought to our attention by um, uh, Pat Wheatley of the First Five Commission, and then um, Councilmember uh, Horton was um, supportive of it. And so we started to talk about possibilities that we could work with the City of Santa Barbara. Um, the uh, Parks and Rec Department was identified as a possibility that we could work with. So what we're planning on is um, participating in existing community events that the Parks and Recreation have at the different community centers. We've already started with one, the Salsa Festival. And uh, we actually identified uh, 12 families and got 12 children insured uh, from that one event. So that's great. So we're, uh, we're, the Children's Health Initiative will be furnishing staff to enroll children at these events and to follow up with parents that are identified as having uninsured children. We're primarily focusing on the two public uh, government-sponsored um, low-income health insurance options, which is Medi-Cal and Healthy Families, and then also our local health insurance product, which is Healthy Kids, which was supported um, so generously by the Board of Supervisors, and we have a lot of openings for the children that don't qualify for Medi-Cal and Healthy Families. So we have, a, we have a, a unique opportunity right here, and it's been great to work with the Parks and Rec Department and the city. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Dooley. Thank you. Anybody have questions? I don't think so. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Um, do we have a motion for consent calendar? Move consent calendar. And, okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Item 11, please. Item number 11, Upper State Street Near-Term Improvements and Design Guidelines Update Work Program. Okay. Mr. Casey. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members. We are back to you today with a request to get your concurrence to go forward with a request for proposals from consultant teams to help us implement the uh, design guidelines for the Upper State Street area. I just wanted to start off briefly with a little context. Uh, as you recall, back in April of 2006, you directed planning staff to go work with the community and do an Upper State Street study. And we did that over a one-year period of time and went to the back to the Planning Commission and then ultimately the City Council in May of this year. And you approved that study, and a real key implementation point of that study was to develop urban design guidelines for this area. And they're pretty thorough and extensive guidelines. We attached a scope of work to your your Council Agenda Report, and we'll summarize it here in the presentation in just a moment. Uh, but they're very comprehensive urban design guidelines. They get at a lot of the issues and key concerns that the community and decision makers had for this area to be used as a tool to evaluate the development projects as they came forward. Including that also were some near-term transportation improvements that we'll identify in our presentation as well. So we are responding to your direction to respond to you with a scope of work, uh, which we have done here, and we're prepared to go out with a request 
asked for proposals to help us prepare it for a couple of reasons. One, it's a, a pretty broad scope that requires a lot of technical expertise that we don't have in-house. And two, we think that's the way to prepare them in the, in the quickest manner, which was also of great interest to the Planning Commission and to you in the hopes to, to try to get this document done within a one-year time period so, again, they could be used to evaluate projects as they come through the design review process. So that's what we're here with, with is a, an approach that tries to provide a document that is responsive and done in an expeditious manner. We've also put in a ballpark cost amount about how much we think it might cost. And it's a large number, which is why we put it in there. It's because we want you to be aware uh, before we go forward about how much this might cost. And we know that may be of concern as well. We evaluated some prior uh, design studies that we've done uh, in the city, the Chapala guidelines, the West Beach improvements, and a couple others. We also looked at the county who did something similar out in Isla Vista with their master planning process. But we also looked at this being a much larger geographical area with three different kind of subcomponents in it. And we used those estimates of how much those studies cost and tried to apply them here and came up with a number that's, you know, in the ballpark of potentially around $300,000. One of the benefits of releasing a request for a proposal is that we'll actually know what that number will be. And so we don't know that today, but we just wanted to share that with you because we know the budget is a concern. And we'll go through now a presentation by Heather Baker and, and Rob Dayton to kind of walk you through what the scope is and what our approach is. But we're, we're open to talk about options, about how to go forward. Uh, but this is our recommendation, and we think it's responsive to the direction that you gave us back in May, and that's why we're here today. Okay, good. Ms. Baker? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. The recommendations today from staff are that Council review the design guidelines and transportation near-term improvements work program and authorize a request for proposals for a full-service consultant contract for the design guidelines. So um, this is the table of contents for the design guidelines which we're proposing. And just so you know, how we've designed the work program, of course, is to follow the City Council direction that we received in May. And so this table of contents list is in response to the study and your direction at that time. It includes analysis of mountain views block by block, open space and creeks, um, building setbacks, size, access and parking, as well as public streetscape components. There's some special aspects regarding this project, and one is, as Paul mentioned, there are many different uh, areas of analysis. It's not just simply design guidelines for style and details of architecture. It's much more than that. We have a component that was began to be discussed by the public uh, before this point, and there is more work that would need to be done to include these concepts of form-based guidelines or variable setbacks. Not many communities have implemented such tools, and so they would take careful analysis. There are special studies that would be involved for not only architectural design, but the view corridors, as I mentioned, block by block is what's been um, asked for here. Um, creek awareness is also an issue for this area. Transportation, parking, and access would be included, as I mentioned before, in the guidelines, and this is special for design guidelines to address these to that degree. And a street tree improvement program which also adds cost, and consultant attendance through hearing process. So this wouldn't be a consultant product that's just a written text. We would actually have a full service type contract, meaning the consultants would participate in the adoption process through, throughout the different phases of the work program. And again, um, all of this has been designed with the idea of the most quick way to get to a quality product for this area of the city. There's three phases that are recommended. The first is a request for proposals, as um, Mr. Casey explained. And we would receive information about not only what consultants are available, would there be any that are local, for example, but also, again, the, the range of costs that it would, would really be realistic. And then for phase two, the consultant text and graphics would be completed. And in phase three would be, of course, the public review that we always have for these types of documents, um, Architectural Board of Review, Planning Commission, Ordinance Committee, and then City Council. And again, with the consultant participating through that part. This um, phasing... Um, this phasing strategy with the consultants doing most of the work of the text and the graphics would allow time for staff to do ordinance work on special topics like perhaps special findings for modifications, which there's been a lot of interest in, potential variable setback options, etc. So with the scope of professional service, 
as mentioned, we are recommending the full service consultant contract with an eye towards completing this high priority project as quickly as possible. Um, and it would be the most timely way to do it, but of course it would have the most cost. There are alternatives which are briefly discussed in the report. For example, staff could play a larger role. We could have uh, smaller contracts with just specialized services with staff doing more management. Um, or, for example, city council could choose certain items to expedite above others if you just wanted to see something quickly done. But the overall process in both of those alternatives would take longer, and you may see some cost savings with that would be the only advantage with those particular routes. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob Dayton from Transportation. Okay, Mr. Dayton. Thank you. You may remember this uh, particular page from the Upper State Street study. These are the near-term near improvements, just to kind of refresh your memory. We mapped them all out, and then we had a detailed description of each. So this is the, this is the proposed implementation strategy for those improvements, and they fall under three categories, capital improvement program, the land development process, and city programs and operations. So going by those categories, first thing we would do is we would take all the near-term improvements that are capital improvements and we'd add those to the capital improvement list. And as you know, you're probably familiar with that that list is pretty extensive and pretty long and each year, every two years, we're uh, looking at that list and, and all the projects compete for what little money we have. Uh, so keep in mind that when we put on the list, it's not that they're going to be done really quick, it's just that they're on the list. Um, <clears throat> some of those include the traffic signal at Macaw and Las Positas that was identified. There were five traffic signals that were identified for improvements. Also new sidewalks and paths, bus stop improvements and medians. And uh, two of the, the improvements that were identified were actually already completed, or one's near and one's completed. And one was the enhanced bus service on, on Upper State Street with the lines 6 and 11, which are now uh, servicing during the peak hours every 10 minutes bus service. And then the other is the uh, the intersection of state and Las Positas where we're going to uh, redesign this this high speed turn to be a little bit more pedestrian oriented. That's in design right now. Under the land development process, this is probably the most promising place where we can get uh, gain ground on the near-term improvements. Of course, the implementation of ca the capital programs, the ones on the list, capital projects, will be drawn from as we find that projects maybe have traffic impacts or um, ways of mitigation, uh, mitigating impacts. The pedestrian master plan standards will be in play now that uh, those are approved. In terms of the sidewalk width, this is di desired on Upper State Street and also noted in the Upper State Street study. The removal of sidewalk obstructions, which was kind of high on a lot of people's priority list. What's cluttering the sidewalk and how can we move that? New Paseo locations, uh, bringing the Paseo concept to Upper State Street, connecting to the neighborhoods, and improved project site access and parking. Uh, one of the things I want to keep in mind is that not all land development applica applications trigger all types of improvements. I can remember when the construction for the, uh, the Loretta Plaza started up, I got called by a planning commission measure member and they said, well, what, what sidewalk improvements are they doing now that they're doing that? Well, that's, that was a facelift. It's just a tenant improvement. And so we don't have a lot of leverage in making, getting these kind of higher ticket items. So it, with each uh, construction project you see on Upper State Street, don't necessarily assume it, that uh, we're going to get some of these improvements. It's really when you're adding more uh, space or units or you have a subdivision. <clears throat> so city programs and operations, the last category, traffic volume, monitoring is what we're going to be doing in-house. And then intelligent transportation systems, as you know, that's really crucial to the Upper State Street corridor and having traffic flow the way we want it, uh, tra uh, traffic demand management strategies. Uh, the bicycle hitching post program, some of you are familiar with this, comes out of the, the, uh, the bicycle master plan, uh, creating a, a destination for the bike trip. We're going to take that program, which has largely been downtown. We do about 100 of them a year. We're going to move half of the program up to Upper State Street uh, this year and uh, put 50 hitching posts up there. So that concludes our presentation, and we're happy to answer your questions. Okay. Questions from uh, – we have um, – let me just go back. I have two people who would like to speak, but if there are some questions from the, um, from the council before then. I can wait. You can wait. Okay. You can wait. Okay. Paul Hernandi will be followed by Kathy McCammon. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Mayor and City Council members. I am Paul Hernandi, 
board member of the Citizen Planning Association, summarizing the written comments emailed to you yesterday by Committee Chair Sheila Lodge on behalf of our South Coast Land Use Committee. As you know from earlier statements, we fully support planning staff's three general recommendations, first endorsed at planning commission's April 12th meeting. Even so, we continue to have concerns in two main areas, open space and transportation. <coughs> Regarding open spaces, with obvious bearing on scenic view protection, we are concerned about the possibility of reducing the current requirements. It is suggested, for example, that existing one-story buildings on small lots should be allowed multiple-story additions without being held to the SD2 requirement of 20-foot front setbacks. We also worry about the possibility that view corridors might end up replacing the panoramic vistas now enjoyed. Last but not least, we miss some stipulation that a significant portion of existing surface parking lots should be turned into landscaped open space whenever new developments meet their on-site parking requirement below grade. We hope that the new design guidelines will address such issues in the spirit of staff's first general recommendation, and I quote, maintain and enhance the unique character of Upper State Street including the public streetscape, open space, creeks, views, site design, and building aesthetics. Now, regarding transportation, we urge that two staff recommendations made in April be included in the present work program. The first recommendation was to prepare a longer range traffic analysis scenario to the year 2030. Such a scenario would address, and I quote again, larger regional and freeway issues in coordination with SBCAG and adjacent jurisdictions as part of the general plan update process. The second recommendation was, and I quote, to address potential longer range regional growth and highway 101 traffic congestion by studying the feasibility of eventually adding a dedicated transit lane on one or both sides of Upper State Street. We believe that even rudimentary outlines of the two proposed studies could yield two important benefits. They would help to assure that, first, uptown land use decisions will be based on realistic long-term region-wide traffic predictions. And that, second, Upper State Street development approvals will be conditioned on the granting of anticipatory easement agreements for possibly needed transit lanes or other transportation improvements in the foreseeable future. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Kathy McCammon. Hello, I'm Kathy McCammon from the League of Women Voters. Um, as probably many of you know, the League has taken a very active role in the Upper State Street study, and we encouraged many of our members to take part in the activities. Having reviewed the city's RFP, we wish to make a few comments that express our concerns and contain information and ideas that we think need to be highlighted. We hope that you will pass our comments on to the consultant. The lead believes that the consultant needs to understand the importance of preserving Upper State Street's unique qualities and that the area should not be like downtown. Second, we think the importance of the existing SD2 zone needs to be recognized and given its proper importance. The study did this and we think that the consultant should reflect this in his work because we feel one of the most important ways to preserve Upper State Street's unique characters, character is to enforce the SD2. Um, we oppose amending the SD2 in regards to three-story buildings. We also are concerned about um, that some things might be misinterpreted there is a recommendation that says allow variation from zoning standards only for important trade-offs such as preservation or creation of mountain views, creek buffers, pedestrian street amenities, or to maximize 
the rear of the site for alley access and or parking. We think it's really important the care be taken that these trade-offs don't become entitlements and that we don't supplant the items that are already required by good policies and good planning. So we don't think people should be rewarded for what we already require, and that modification should be strictly saved for what is really above and beyond normal standards and expectations. Related to the above, but a point to be aware of in the other implementation measures is the importance of preserving the panoramic views of the mountains. Minimal view corridors such as those at corners or little framed views aren't adequate. It's really important to keep in mind that the views of the mountains are what gives Upper State Street its real sense of place. Um, with working with variable setbacks, we think care must be taken to not undermine the SD2. We see a real challenge with the advent of underground parking because this wasn't contemplated in the past when the SD2 was developed. Um, while we support underground parking, the parking lots inadvertently do allow for panoramic views. These open areas should not be replaced with bigger, bulky buildings, but with open areas such as paseos and the like. We think that the challenge here will be how to legally require this open space. Um, we have some questions regarding the amount of resources, both in time and money, it will take to include form-based zoning. We think this also raises some legal questions, and if we had our druthers, this would be an area that maybe could be put off, because we have good policies and we have good recommendations in the study, so we're not sure that this is needed. Um, we're very impressed by the traffic study that dealt with the issue of mixed use when there is a restaurant and how the parking doesn't work, that you need to have more parking if you have a busy restaurant. We think this is also true of commercial projects where the commercial is open past 6 p.m. We also need to avoid situations like Trader Joe's and the surgery center. Um, given the studies that have been emerged regarding the health impacts of air pollution policies, we need to make sure that we do not have housing too close to a busy thoroughfare. The same applies to noise pollution and as have, we have said before, the typical mitigation of requiring closed windows and required air conditioning is not acceptable and is counter to the idea of sustainability. We think parking solutions have to be realistic. This is a place where locals and people from Goleta come to shop. We don't want them to drive away. And parking solutions also need to take into consideration small businesses. We don't want to force them out with costly parking solutions. Last but not least, we would like to see a public member included in the review by the, of the design guidelines and the working group. And we would offer ourselves, and we'd be happy to have someone from League serve on the committee. We hope that the consultant would be aware of the recommendations that have that some recommendations may have long-term unintended consequences and these should be avoided. The study really dealt with a short time period and we think care really must be taken to leave some potential for the future. That after all, part of sustainability is to not use up all our resources in the short term and allow future generations some flexibility. Remember, the more development we have, the more impacts it will generate. Traffic it will get worse and air quality will deteriorate. We hope this does not happen and that we don't do take up all the resources that may be left for future generations. I shortened my remarks, but I will leave the longer text 
here for you and for staff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we don't have any other speakers. Ms. Hakuni. Well, Madam, I thank you. I just wanted to uh, make note, I think most folks also got a letter from Allied Homeowners Association, Allied Neighborhood Association, and they just, I just wanted to put what they, their position on the record, uh, that they adopted uh, 10807, and just to very briefly paraphrase it, they would like the working group to be open to the public, they would like an opportunity to meet with key members of the consulting team before they uh, start certain points of work, and they have concerns about the mixed-use ordinance and the discussed revisions and amendments that we may be taking on, and they have some suggestions but would like us to uh, maybe not go forward with that until we have that much fuller discussion. In a nutshell, that was their position. Thank you. It was signed by their president, Judy Reyes. Okay, thank you. Um, it's to the council, Mr. House. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sure. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, thank staff. We have three different kind of options in front of us here. I, I just want to weigh in that I think that um, this is pretty important that we move forward with this with uh, with some earnestness. And I uh, appreciate appreciate staff's recommendation for the first option, which is to use the consultant approach. But I will add. Um, that it would be um, that we should we should use that approach only if it's still community based in terms of input and participation. Um, one of the concerns I would have is if uh, um, the uh, the consultant were to go away and then come back with the suggest with recommendations without having uh, to continue checking with our staff, check in and take input as, as we will roll along. And these are very complex and very important issues to our community. And so it's not to, to turn it over to some outside consultant uh, away from here, but to actually have them uh, come and continue to work with us very, very closely. And the purpose for which is to make sure we affect as much of the development that might be in the pipeline as possible as opposed to um, um, having horses get out of the barn and that, that kind of thing. So that's the idea. Um, one of the th things that I was a little concerned about, and, and I want to ask staff a question about, um, when I look on page one of attachment two, at the very top it says summary direction. And it has three key things, A, B, and C. A, urban design, and it describes maintaining and enhancing the character of Upper State Street, etc. B is transportation, improving traffic, circulation, pedestrian and bicycle connectivity and parking. And I appreciate Mr. Hernati uh, um, bringing up the um, concept that we've discussed really at length about the idea of a um, dedicated transit lane concept for the future. Not like we know exactly where it's going to go, but um, I, have a, I have a big concern here that if we don't um, bring that into the conversation now, that land development decisions over the coming years, near term and long term, would, pro would prohibit that from being a valid or viable consideration in the future. And I know that's a big, big issue. I mean, there's a lot that gets tied into that. Um, but it, for me, it seems very important that that be part of this uh, guideline conversation. And, and I, I just want to get a little validation on that. If we don't bring that up now, if we don't put this on the table now for at least consideration like we're doing with these other things, you know, it kind of leaves us in a, a spot, doesn't it, for the future and not, not really, you know, if we, if we have put this off too far to the future, suddenly there's going to be developments in the way and there's going to be, you know, projects that may prohibit us from doing really the right thing out there. And I think that's very, very important. So perhaps staff could address that for, for me. Yeah. Mr. Dayton or somebody who yeah. is familiar with the transportation issues can <laughs> talk about that. Mr. Dayton. Madam Mayor, Council Member House, I think you, I think you raise a good point. I think that, um, you know, certainly looking at a dedicated transit lane is a very challenging effort. Um, it is, uh, it re requires uh, drawing a line on the map saying where you're going to do it. Uh, which is probably the first step in trying to figure out where you want it to go because it could get, go on one side of the street, it could go on both sides of the street, it could go in the middle of the street. There are a range of options and, um, and it plays into the, all the values we're talking about, um, the values of view, views and setbacks and, and building heights and open space. So uh, it, is, it, it does seem fundamental. Uh, the caution is that that road is, is expensive 
and um, and could be hard, and uh, also will certainly delay um, the the guidelines uh, to some extent. Uh, we don't know what that is, um, and it will. It, and I think I mentioned cost. It would make the the cost of the process, um, you know, more expensive. That's not to say that that's not the right decision, but with all the things that we've been given to work with. Um, and you know another thing is the the, tra the transit lanes were kind of a surprise in this process. You know we kind of uh, set our course for a short term gain, and what do we need to do now? There is a, you know someone's ringing the emergency bill because we got all these projects up there, which kind of started the process. We put them on hold, and we need to get going again. Uh, so that's kind of the cautionary tale: is that if we do um, look at this kind of stone that's been uncovered and it looks promising, it looks like maybe a good transportation option long term. Uh, it could slow us down in the, for the short-term gain. I see. Madam Mayor and Council Member House, yes, I just please. want to piggyback on that. I completely with everything that Mr. Dayton said, and that's one of the things we're struggling with is that, you know, we kind of got direction from Planning Commission and Council for the scope of work we got here. We could add in this look at a transit lane. It will be a little more harder and a little bit more complicated. The idea of just really quickly take a quick brush and make sure you're not precluding it in the future Boy, it's hard to know how far down the analysis track you go to get a comfort level that you're okay. The, the one thing I do think about is the SD2 setback, which is pretty wide, and which council kind of reaffirmed at the hearing in May, that we didn't want to really be looking at modifications uh, to creep in within the SD2 setback, although that is one of the things to look at here is on very unique situations. And so that in and of itself is giving a broader kind of corridor to be looking at in the future so that I don't think we're, we're losing a whole lot if you're keeping the SD2 setbacks where they are. But it doesn't answer your question exactly, or like Mr. Dayton says, of where is the line and how much space would you really need and where might it go and which side of the street. And right. I mean, well, that's even that part. Even that is a big, a huge discussion. On the other hand, on the other hand, I think that all of us would have to agree that, that one of the biggest issues in the outer State Street, upper State Street area is traffic. I mean, you just can't get away from it. I mean, it's just that's the, the parking and traffic and the impacts of any development or any changes up there um, over and over again that, and, and any, any project that comes forward. I mean, it seems like that's the, um, that's the elephant in the room and everybody can see it and it's just right there. So um, we do know that transit is an important component here. And I, I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to weigh in real strong on this right now, and I hope there's others here who will agree with me that that is so important to the future of Upper State Street that it should be a, a key one of the elements that gets discussed here. And as far as this can be, you know, this, will not, this isn't going to solve it. This is just going to begin the conversation. And then, and then as time moves on in the future, we'll have this moment in time where we've said that's an important part of our vision for State Street. Um, and then we'll work on it and develop it and enhance it and, and do capital program stuff for it and that kind of thing. But I, I, I agree with you, um, Mr. Dayton, it was one of those aha moments in this process that I don't think I went into it with that, uh, re that thought. In fact, when I first heard it, I almost was skeptical that somebody was trying to, you know, you kind of catch me on something, you know, <laughs> kind of weird like that. And then I realized, wait a minute, this is really important to the future of this area and for the neighbors on, on both sides and all the rest. So that's my two cents on that piece. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Barnwell and then Mr. Williams. Um, thanks, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, this is huge for me. I mean, since I've been involved in these processes associated with the city, starting with the Planning Commission, I don't remember one that that really gives me such a a warm feeling that we're going to get someplace. I hope I don't get too disappointed in it. I mean, we've done so many studies, which have all been excellent. You know, we do the pedestrian master plan, we do the circulation element, we've done all these things, but none of them seemed to have the teeth that this one is proposing. This one is proposing coming up with some ideas that are going to get implemented or the ordinances will be created to implement those ideas so I'm really looking forward to that I wanted to um, I wanted to talk about two things that the League of Women Voters and the CPA some somehow has an automatic negative response to the phrase form-based zoning and I can understand that we may not want to go to an entire code change but the, the basic principle of form-based um, zoning is that you look at where you want your building's height to be limited 
and you look at it block by block, intersection by intersection. And you mentioned that in here, and I'm, I'm very encouraged by that, because when you take a walk down that section of State Street, you see some areas are more important than others, some intersections, we want lower buildings there. And, and in, the, in the degree to which we analyze that, I think we will have a better plan for that boulevard. Uh, on the land development page, can we go back? You had a page that talked about land development. <clears throat> Um, and uh, am I wrong on that? Yes. Capital of, right there. Right there. <clears throat> maybe I'm. Maybe it isn't the place for it. But creeks are for me conspicuous by their absence on this page. Um, specifically, if we're talking about Paseo locations, if you look at the. Um, the confluence of the two creeks right there by the YMCA and, and a project right adjacent to that, which is a, a, a tabula rasa for discussion about what to do with the creek. And then we have the vacant lot that's uh, next to the auto dealership down there. there. There's several places where I think creeks in connection with those paseos is an important concept. And I, I wouldn't want it to be lost in this discussion of land development process. For me, it is one of the two or three principal elements of land development is how we treat those creeks. I, I see this as both a visionary document and then a nuts and bolts ordinance change. And I, I, I look forward to that, how we wrestle that to the ground. My own philosophy on transportation is to divide it into two categories. One of them is regional transportation. How do we get from Ventura to Santa Barbara to Lompoc? And another one is intra-South Coast. The regional transportation is a very difficult nut to crack because so many agencies come into play to be successful. We have to talk with Union Pacific and Caltrans and the Feds and the state and Ventura and all these other cities. The intra, the South Coast transportation plan is I think, easier for us to get our arms around. In the downtown corridor, the transportation issues seem to me to be things that people are willing to live with. The downtown core has definitely got traffic, buku traffic, but it has a parking plan that helps assist that traffic to get immediately parked, and then you use a lot of pedestrian activity to get back and forth. I think that I think the study of the upper State Street area requires that our conversations about parking, which are an integral part of this plan, must include the transportation linkages and how the buses and or the cars and or the bikes or pedestrians move along these corridors. It, we cannot talk about parking without talking about transportation. It just simply doesn't work. And I think downtown is the model for us to, to see how those are so interconnected. I'm not suggesting that downtown is the model for what we want out in Upper State Street, but they're together. To continue to follow this line of reasoning, I am 100% in support of the concepts that my esteemed colleague, Mr. House, was just mentioning. We have to talk about the boulevard of State Street and and its ability to carry some sort of mass transit device, whether that's a dedicated bus lane or whether that's a streetcar lane in the middle of the boulevard, whether it's on one side or the other, I can't answer that question, but I think this study must talk about that. I realize it's a, a complicated and detailed discussion, but <clears throat> as, as Mr. House so correctly said, we can't really correctly talk about a, a parking system up there for it, which I hope we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking about a, an integrated parking system up there, different than but parallel to the one we have downtown, one park concept. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to work up there. Now, d that includes maybe a discussion of the, of the uh, La Curba Plaza, which I see you kind of want to keep off to the side. I, no problems with that, except as you can see, you talk about one thing, you've got to talk about another one. So how you draw the line and say, we're not going to talk about this, but we are going to talk about this, I, that's your challenge. But <clears throat> um, I just don't see any way that we can get to the heart of why we're doing this if we aren't talking about shared parking and a transportational system that makes the shared parking work. 
<clears throat> and then lastly, and again, I want to just give kudos to everybody. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're just, we're, wherever we're going with this, I, I'm it's so much in favor of it. And lastly, I don't see um, a discussion of the Kyrail Corridor. And I know that my own thoughts on the Kyrail Corridor and those shared by the Planning Commission in several discussions have seen the Kyrail Corridor as the type of... <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, the type of vehicular linkage between downtown and La Cumbre Plaza. So the degree to which, and I drive that all the time looking at it closely with my quasi-engineering carpenter general contractor eye to see how much room is there now and what could we possibly do there. Because again, we are talking about relieving some of the transportational chaos on State Street and, and some of that traffic is through traffic. A lot of it wants to go from Las Positas intersection to La Cumbra and doesn't necessarily need to beat its way along the uh, State Street corridor. So I'd like to throw those things out for future discussion. I agree with Mr. House's comments 100% as a planner. I, we, I don't know how we can avoid doing that. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor, very much. Ma Madam Mayor, yes, go I, ahead, Mr. Casey. Just to help counsel as sure. you continue to deliberate on this, just a real quick response to kind of the comments we've heard. First off, in the creek section of the scope of work, I think we identified the issues that you have there. PowerPoint is just a brief summary. So, but, mm -hmm. but you know, we've got creek protection, development orientation, creekside paths. I think those issues are covered in here. And then Councilmember Barnwell raised kind of the key question that we're looking for direction here today is where do we draw the line? because that's really important on the scope of work and that and and we're open to that we're we're being responsive to a desire to have a document that can be used in evaluating projects that can be done within a year which in our time frame is relatively quick uh, <laughs> so you know that that's kind of why we crafted these as essentially as design guidelines that's what they are a lot of the issues that mr house and mr barnwell have brought up were included in the resolution that council adopted but they were kind of longer term planning issues and we kind of drew the line on this scope of work from a staff recommendation staff point as as being a little bit more of the shorter term toolbox to get into your decision making boards and commissions to evaluate projects doesn't mean that's the right answer and that's why we're here and want to get your feedback but the more longer term stuff we put in the longer the study will be as we kind of chew on these issues which won't be resolved in a two-week time period madam mayor if i, I forgot sure, something ahead, uh, one last thing i wanted to add is the the sd2 zoning was originally implemented and i believe there were additional fees attached to property developments in that area those fees going to uh, road improvements I'm in hopes that this discussion could analyze an expansion of that in the future. As you know, Mr. Casey, our Santa Barbara permits and fees are way below other communities throughout the tri-counties. And the degree to which it would be appropriate and feasible to add such fees to then achieve these longer range goals, because, you know, Mr. House was talking about this vision, but by God, I think we pretty much got our vision. Now we got to build that vision, and we got to get money to do that. So the degree to which we can discuss a a, a reinvigoration of the SD2 fee process with a new goal, I think would also be worthy. And Madam Mayor and Councilman mm -hmm. Barnwell, we already have a consultant on board looking at an impact fee analysis citywide, not even just for Upper State. And so mm -hmm. that's going to be coming up shortly. It really ties into the infrastructure CIP committee that uh, you're going to form that's going to look at how we finance things. So that's underway already. Mr. Williams? Well, it won't be a surprise that uh, when I say that I'm willing to I'm ready to, to die on that transit lane hill along with Mr. House and Mr. Barnwell. <laughs> um, I, I, I think there's nothing that we can do on Upper State Street that is as important as wrestling with the question of where we put the transit lane and how we do it because the question of medians, I mean, the, what we decide on medians could be rendered totally irrelevant by what we decide on, on the transit lane. Um, what we decide on parking, on parking requirements, you know, it changes the whole game if, if what right now is takes, it takes about 45, 50 minutes to get from downtown to Goleta by bus. If that changed to a half an hour, that changes the whole, the whole equation. Uh, it, especially, it also changes it for drivers as well, because if you have a transit lane, you don't have to um, always stop behind the bus that can't quite get into the curb cut or doesn't have a curb cut when it's stopped. So to, 
improve both flow for transit riders and for for cars I think it's 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 crucial and I think especially since we have large development applications coming in right now uh, we should be if we're going to do a transit lane we should be asking them to do a transit lane not asking them to do curb cuts that we're then we're going to change around a few years down the line if we add a transit lane um, so I you know I I feel like that needs to be added um, it needs to be in in my mind it's it's not completely a bad thing if it goes longer because I was looking at the dollar figures here in a in a sense and it if all of those are expended in the next fiscal year, I think we have a hard time coming up with all that money. Uh, so if that's spread out about between two fiscal years, I think that isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. I really want to get this done right. Um, I've, I'm usually the person that's ready to um, get it done tomorrow, but um, without a upper State Street plan without a transit lane is a huge gaping hole. Um, I think the, the, the creek uh, issues that you've outlined are, are great. I think you're totally on the right track on that. I, I think they're very consistent with uh, what would be some of the desires of the Creeks Committee. Uh, I wanted to ask if you have gone to the Creeks Committee lately. I think it would be a worthwhile exercise to do so uh, before you come up um, with, with all the details with them. They haven't. Um, and, then, um, and then you'll... You'll, it'll probably be no surprise to you that my other one is wrestling with commercial. Uh, the statement was made by that the more development we have, the more impacts of growth we have. That is sometimes true. It's sometimes not true. In the case of Upper State Street, we haven't had that much change, but we continue to have more traffic. And so we, while we don't have much development, we keep on getting more things that we associate with impacts of development, and that's because commuting and using it as a commuting thoroughfare is in, on the increase. In a sense, change in Upper State Street gives us an opportunity to maybe reduce that. And so I, I've, I, I don't, I'm not going to die on this hill today because this is a much more long-term discussion, is the question of commercial and whether we should be um, adding only a certain amount, whether we should be maintaining the same amount, or whether we should be reducing commercial, which is what my position would be on the Upper State Street corridor. I, thus far, this is the only tried and true legal way we have to control growth, is to control commercial square footage. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, the tough thing is how do you add some housing while still decreasing traffic? And I think that's uh, decreasing commercial. And we now have one great opportunity uh, because I, I do want to mention that uh, one of the applicants for the two large projects, Investec on Upper State Street, has said that they are going to be willing to include in their analysis what would happen if they got rid of the commercial component of their project. And I want to, first of all, thank Investec for being willing to look at that because that, um, I think, is something that is a tool in, all, in our toolbox of development review and see you know, what happens when we get rid of some of the commercial? Uh, does that knock down our traffic counts to the, to the point where we start getting this under control? So um, my main thing is the transit lane, and the second thing is just to keep in the, uh, in it, as much as possible in the analysis, the wrestle with what to do with commercial space. Okay. Ms. Schneider. Thank you. This little appetizer is turning into a full course meal, it sounds like. Um, I kind of want to have my cake and eat it, too, to continue on that. I, I go back and forth with this whole, we're here today looking at this because we said as a council we were going to jumpstart the general plan update and look at Upper State Street and put the plan together and have a study, and we had the study, and it's not, you know, it's just a study until you finally get to putting guidelines and things together. We need to move forward, and I get that, and I understand that's why we're here and today's just so just to get some facts out there and make sure I'm clarifying for myself what we're being asked for today is just the to give staff direction to put forward an RFP so then we can come back and decide what the actual final product would be and how much it would cost we don't have a final price tag yet because the price tag does worry me 
quite a bit. Um, but also just to get the facts out, you, you mentioned you had a plus minus, you know, cost high, staff low, staff high, cost low or something. <laughs> but the, the, the difference in the cost is not really that big. Uh, you're, according to the staff report, if, a, if it was a smaller consultant contract, the, the cost with, with more staff time would still be in the $200,000 range. So we're really only talking about fifty dollars to $100,000, it seems like, in, the, in terms of money. Not to, but then there's the staff time issue, and then that would lead to the question for me is what then are you not working on as staff? Um, <clears throat> because there might be some other issues that, that are being neglected, and then we'll get panned on not focusing on other issues. So... That's that's a concern, I guess, and and um, and if all of this is to be expended this fiscal year, I'm not quite sure how we how we do that and where it comes from. Um, that fee analysis can come at any time, and we can figure that out. I'm not quite sure how that's going to be implemented either. So, and then um, just to, there was some question asked about the work group, the uh, two ABR one PC member. Is that a public meeting? Is that not? A, I mean, what's the what's the process behind that? Yeah, Mr. Casey, Madam Mayor, and Council mm -hmm. members, that's just a, a once or twice kind of check in with them to kind of get their just kind of buy in as we're going along without going through the whole huge process which would follow. It certainly would be open to the public. It's not intended to be a big public input meeting. This is not a single family design steering committee no. <laughs> neighborhood no. preservation. Because that's the other thing that right. comes to mind. I mean, I, I wasn't on the council when when the council at that point decided to say, let's not do the big consultant contract, let's focus more on staff and maybe stretch it out a little bit. Think, But no, it was going to take two and a half years with the neighborhood preservation ordinance. And yet, that's similar. I'm feeling a little deja vu here reading the document that there's, you know, this option of how much technical expertise do you want to hire versus what do you want to work on in-house. In so um, I, I feel the need to move forward, but I am a little wary of the price tag and, and, and doing it now. And um, So I guess I, where, where I'm coming from is well, you've heard everything you want to know about transit lanes, and it, you know, so I think certainly if anything that comes from this RFP has to make sure that, that – the transit component is is in there somehow. I'm not sure if if we need to do, know about every little detail about how a transit lane would work, but we certainly don't want to put a product together that we would have to redo in the future because I think that is the vision, or that's the main vision of of looking at Upper State Street is is a space for transit, and so why go through all this and all the time, energy, and money if then we'd have to go back and change things because we want then add a transit lane? So that seems to me. Um, not the you know not the most ex expeditious way in to go, but so I I'm going to have to see what the proposals are really to, before I can say yes let's do exactly this. But um, I understand the and I, I I feel Mr. Barnwell's enthusiasm over here, <laughs> <laughs> and then I see the chair of the finance committee come in over there, and you know and so I you know there's there's uh it, you know it's just trying to to balance those things out. So I, I'm I'm happy to approve the recommendation, but when when the proposal comes back, I guess I'd really want to look at the timeline and the budget impact of that and how that would work. Okay. And I think okay, Ms. Farconi. That's it. Thank you. Um, and Roger, I'll relinquish your chair here in just a moment. But uh, um, this is an interesting discussion, and uh, I want to preface my remarks by saying that nothing that I say should be construed as trying to slow down the process or stop the process. I'm fully in favor, fully in favor of moving forward with creating guidelines and the work program but this is a matter of some practicality. This is a large, unbudgeted sum from the general fund if we go forward today. Now, I, it's my understanding that you're not asking us to allocate any sums today. So, but what we are being asked to do is to give you authority to go out and to get, based on this scope of work, an RFP or RFPs that will then break down the various different projects and consulting uh, tasks uh, that at some, in some way we are sanctioning today. Now, I know that's not written in stone or blood or any of those things, but it is 
a scope of work that is defined that does not contain this conversation about a dedicated transit lane, which I understand all the complications about putting that in and what that does to the process and so forth. But I'm wondering whether or not we don't just take a tiny little, not step back, but approach it slightly differently. And that would be to put out the RFPs today on this scope of work, version one, and then also add a scope of work that would include some sort of a dedicated transit lane. Because I agree with what I've heard, and I've traveled that street long enough to know that that is going to be the wave of the future. And I think to not include it and know what we're talking about is not doing the universal approach that we were trying to do with this project. So if we put out the RFPs today with the scope of work and then plus, well, what if we added this? What would that cost and how would that be? Um, and we come back, according to the timeline here, you were looking at having the RFPs back by the end of November, beginning of December. Well, as a matter of practicality, those are the holidays. And for all intents and purposes, really, on the ground, we're not going to get to these RFPs until January, possibly February, to then have you bring them back to us after analysis of what are the various components going to cost. I don't think it slows anything down. I think it allows us a, t a bit of a breath to incorporate some of the things that we would like to see that aren't in here. And who knows, at that point, once we know what piece is going to cost what, there may be opportunities, instead of it all coming from the general fund, to have some of it allocated from streets, from creeks, from SD2 fees, from things that we may or may not be looking at today because we're looking at one giant lump of stuff that has to come from the general fund. Well, that may not be, at the end of the day, the way it works out. So I'm suggesting that we take a wee step and we do the RFPs and get the information back and at the beginning of the year really do a thorough analysis based on real facts and real numbers in a compartmentalized kind of way to see whether or not we can share this burden. The other thing is that by that time, in the beginning of 08, the staff, maybe not here at the council level, but the staff is looking at the next budget cycle. Now, we won't see it until several months from there, but my point is, is that you all at staff will begin to get your heads around what is not just north of a quarter of a million dollars, but is probably in its entire reality closer to a half a million dollars. This is a, a budget that needs to be taken into consideration and needs to be budgeted somehow. Now, can we sort of pay some things in 08 out of unallocated funds currently? We, probably. So it won't stop it in its tracks is my point. I put that out there for staff's consideration, for my colleagues' consideration, because I, I don't want to see this stop. But the money and the, the transit lane and some other things, concerns from the public that we've heard, we might want to just take a quick breath. It doesn't stop us from putting out the RFPs and getting the information. That's my suggestion. Madam Mayor? Yes. I, I know we haven't yes. heard from you or Councilmember right. Horton, but if you don't mind, I'll jump in again. <laughs> um, hearing the council deliberation, clearly it seems like there's an interest in doing the transit study. And, and so that's different from what the scope we proposed today. And also hearing and, and what we uh, felt was going to be an issue was the budget and the timing of the budget mm -hmm. in that regard as well. You know, I, I think we feel if you want to do the transit analysis, and you want to do it right, that should probably come first, that you really should answer that question and then we go do this scope of work with that information in hand because then you're working with it and know what you're doing. And, and so maybe there's a way to kind of 
work it both out with the only detriment being a little longer time and that would be go do the transit analysis now and get that underway in a separate request for proposals will identify how to fund it that would be done this fiscal year uh, we could then you know release this RFP at some point to get a better idea of the cost and I'm not sure when we would do that but that this would become a fiscal year 09 work effort that we would budget accordingly for such that you do the transit first and then you come back with the, the design guidelines that you have scoped out here it will be more money overall and it will take longer than than what we've been uh, trying to deliver for you but that might be an option that kind of gets you the transit you're looking for and also helps a little bit with the budgeting issue uh, in a fiscal year standpoint okay mr. Horton thank you for not being available for a jury or for them not wanting you or something <laughs> well I was uh, apologize for being late but doing my jury service is did a, they, did they something we like all you? need to do um, <laughs> so I have no idea what anybody said, but um, <laughs> but I know what I want to say. Um, long past the time, probably uh, I'll probably be motoring up that uh, area of town in my wheelchair, or perhaps with my walker. But nevertheless, one of these days, uh, decades, uh, there's going to be a commuter rail system, and there's going to be um, really good public transportation, and it's likely that that um, system will come into the area at, uh, at lower state uh, where it does now and if we don't plan for that time uh, 10 20 30 years out right now then we'll we'll uh, simply not be doing what we should be doing as community leaders and trying to think ahead uh, I don't know what everyone else said but I think that now is the time and I'm perfectly comfortable with what Paul has just suggested if you want to do that first that makes good sense to me but if we don't do that and we then can't do it because of what for whatever reason then I don't think we've done our jobs as you know, said elected representatives of the population and so therefore I would implore us to um, to do that study and to do it whenever you think it needs to be done okay. thanks I, I too agree with, about the transit being important because if we do the other first year you might be cutting off some options and I or at least making the options harder so um, I think it's a good idea to go ahead first but can you just uh, and maybe you've already done this but uh, tell me how that interfaces in with plan Santa Barbara because I can't um, it's about that same time and I know it's difficult um, that's why I'm willing to go out on, on an RFP and, and get the best consultant because we've got to do it right. But I just want to know how it interfaces, if you know, and if you don't. Madam Mayor, Council Mayor, I mean, of course it, it interfaces with Plan yeah. Santa Barbara. Uh, but it, it's also kind of a finite look at a certain geographic part of town. Uh, so if you're kind of keeping it focused in that regard, it seems like that's something that we could bring in some outside expertise and and look at that and I agree with the comments you know this is a that mr. councilmember Horton said this is a long-term vision I'm not sure this is something we're gonna have the money to implement in the next three to five years to, to really go but I think as mr. house said earlier it's making sure though we're not precluding it and actually building towards it and, and working towards something and that makes a lot of sense um, but I just don't want to set out false expectations that we're gonna have a dedicated transit system going down State Street you know in the next three years I mean, you can. You're running for council, but I. <laughs> you can say that. That's right. <laughs> Promise away. <laughs> chicken in every pot. Yes, right. Chicken in every pot. We can do this. Okay. Well, um, Mr. Horton, you didn't say too much different than we did, so thank you very much, yeah, Mr. House. Well, then let me ask uh, staff just uh, one question, okay. uh, and I will make a motion. Then. And okay. um, is it your recommendation then that we? Um, in a sense bifurcate this and we start with the transit study and so you've got two RFPs basically um, and that it's the same as what's here except for that added piece up front okay very good and you've heard our comments and you've taken into consideration the different things that I, I have a list here and you have your list there of the things that were brought up and uh, was there anything here that just seems that you need to rail against or that was totally out of the <laughs> question or something because um, I would include our comments and the things that you've heard today in my motion correct it Oh, good point. Uh, the, the one issue we heard that, that wouldn't be addressed with that game plan that you just kind of outlined right. would be Councilmember Barnwell's kind of issue of the broader traffic, Kai Real, how that interplays and in kind of doing a master traffic plan. And I think that, again, was one of those longer term issues. And, and that will be looked in Plan Santa Barbara to some extent as we do kind of a citywide traffic study. And Mr. Dayton can. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, actually, um, I'm, I'm not sure Paul knew this, uh, is that uh, in our budget this year, 
you remember Cottage Hospital uh, set aside two hundred fifty thousand right. dollars to do uh, to begin the plan, and so we are preparing an RFP. In fact, to look at that entire corridor in interchanges, Las Positas and Mission, as well as the Calle Real, um, undoing the mess we, that uh, was created and improving the flow. Now, that doesn't mean that, that, that the dollars to do the project are there. That's a, that it's an extreme sum, but at least we'll have a, a plan that we can begin to look at uh, how we piece that back together and get the transportation system in that area we need. Okay. okay well, then, Thank Madam, you. And Madam Mayor, if I could. Yeah. Go ahead. Ask for some clarification and direction uh, in this regard. I just want to make sure that we do understand this will slow down when we'll have guidelines mm -hmm. in the hands of ABR and Planning Commission to look at projects. And I just I want us to go in eyes open in that. And I think you have. And I just wanted to uh, make sure we clarify that. And then also, did you want to see the scope of work for the transit study before we send it out to an RFP? Or do you want us to draft it, get an RFP, get a dollar amount, and bring that back and? Yeah. I want to see it. So do I. <laughs> then we will bring that back. That'll, you know, we'll have to develop a scope of work, right. bring it back on a future council agenda, get right. your concurrence on it, and then go forward with an RFP. Yeah, and, it makes sense that we that. would look at it. As, okay. uh, yeah, Mr. Bargainwell, do you have something? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, you, did you? Already, I'll just second that. Just motion. second. Yeah. I was okay. Motion second. second. I had a motion. motion I didn't know if we had a second. Did you make a motion, Grant? Well, this is a tacit motion. Go for it. Right? This is the motion. The motion yeah, is to um, okay. to approve the um, uh, for the Community Development Department and Public Works Department to jointly issue requests for proposals. Now, this includes bringing back a scope of work for a first one on transit. Okay. Is that correct? Second. Got it. Okay. That's it. Okay. Mr. Um, Bargainwell. Go ahead. I want to go. I want to go back a little bit. To I hate to be so limited in my awareness, but I only have. I only know what I know, right? Um, <laughs> the the downtown the downtown parking plan, which has made downtown work so well, uh, it ironically was an answer to outer State Street development, and in conjunction with it, we widened the sidewalks. That I think that sidewalk widening project was like in 69, 70, 71. That's when we took the lanes from downtown and widened those sidewalks. It was in conjunction with the idea that we were going to have people parking once and then they're going to need to walk. So recognizing, again, a completely different set of concerns in Outer State Street, but I ask this question, if there is some kind of a parking plan that we are thinking about in our long-range discussion of Outer State Street, how does that fit in to a discussion that we have just authorized? Because it seems to me, again, I only know what I know, but if we, and I, I'm hoping that the, the transportation corridor will look not only just at buses, the idea of maybe buses on an interim basis, but then also maybe there's a streetcar at some point, maybe it's 15 years or 20 years down the road, talking about what it actually might be, whether it's in the middle, whether it's either side, I don't know. But those seem to me to tie into an integrated parking plan that would cause people to use those facilities. Now, now um, Mr. Williams brings up a good point that a lot of people getting on the bus are going Masaya. But some of them, we hope, in this new plan, will be picking it up at Las Positas and going to La Cumbra or picking it up at, you know, somewhere and just doing a little two or three block hop, which, again, I see as tying into a parking plan to make the transportation plan work, period. Yes, Paragraph. Mr. Dayton. End. <laughs> uh, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Barnwell. Yeah, I think that there is a strong tie. I think that if you'll recall in the study, one of the challenges of the park once philosophy in Upper State Street is not the same landscape. It's a lot longer blocks, it's far less dense, and uh, the walking environment is not as attractive. Of course, with the goals that we're proposing today, we'll want to change that and, and make that better. With a dedicated transit facility, perhaps the park once uh, could work um, you know, it could be a more of a strategic place because you could get on a, a transit vehicle that was not encumbered by, is not encumbered by traffic, and then move on the street a little bit more freely. Um, I think we still don't believe in the future that the walking is going to be as uh, a dominant form of transportation as we might find downtown. Um, okay. But the transit, the transit vehicle does bring that tie in, and we can look at that as a possibility in, when we look at that dedicated transit lane. And we're talking, I, I just want to clear this up, Mr. House, because it's not quite clear to me yet. You're going to come back with some stuff about what, what you imagine this study will be, but is it, is it going to be, I, I want to be sure that it includes a discussion of stops within 
out of State Street for someone who wants to go from one block to another or one block to two blocks, as well as Mr. Williams' concern that it's also getting through that area to get to some place down in Goleta. Is that what we're talking about? Or are we just talking about the real estate and how do we get a fat enough boulevard to do something in the future? I'm not sure what we're going to be looking at. We're absolutely talking about the system. Okay. You refer okay. To it. And okay. It's the system first, and then it's in a very technical study because it, where you position the vehicle plays into all the other transport, all the other transportation things that okay. are happening: pedestrian crossing, signaling, and uh, there are some firms that are very uh, uh, have experience in these and looking okay. at these corridors where Great. you know we're talking a high level of, of of strategy on what's the best placement to get to make sure we don't screw up the existing transportation system we have. Okay with a dedicated one. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, I look Thank forward to this. I think it's a good first. I think we started here by having an Upper State Street traffic study, right? That's how we got here in the first place. Sure. So I think it it's important yeah. that this is the first step. I agree. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Falcone, did you have something to Just add? Just briefly to clarify for myself, I guess, more than anything, but also for folks out there to understand, we are letting two RFPs at this point, one for transportation and one for the scope of work as described in this. Yes? Uh, the, Madam Mayor, Council yeah. Member Falcone, the, the, the second RFP, the design guideline, I think needs to trail a little bit. Yeah. All right, it's, so not it's not fair to consultants to ask for a proposal that you say, and we'll come back to you in a year when we want to start okay. it. So I got to, we're going to have to think about that because we also, though, okay. wanted to inform the budget for next fiscal right. year so we have a decent idea. So Okay. So that being said, and that being very, very clear, that the RFP for the scope of work that is in front of us today is not going to happen immediately makes it even more um, important to understand that the guidelines and the rules that ABR and PC and all of the review boards are operating under today are going to stay as is for the near future until we can get back to the guidelines. So all of the things that ABR and the review boards were looking forward to being able to have as tools pursuant to these guidelines has just been put on hold. True, Madam Mayor, although you do Go have ahead. the adopted resolution from the Upper State Street Study, sure. which did identify some goals and priorities for people to Good. be looking at. That's that my helps. next point. How much of that can they rely on? Can they start to incorporate some of this mm -hmm. stuff and into them? Well, I, they already have. I understand. Yeah, right. Guidelines are much clearer. I'm trying to get lay a little foundation here for everybody to understand the lay of the land at this moment in time. And, and I guess so that there isn't confusion about, well, you know, these guidelines say, well, there aren't guidelines yet and they're not going to be, but there are the adopted resolutions and so forth that they can hang their hats on. Correct. Madam Mayor, Council mm -hmm. Falcone, yes, you definitely have an adopted City Council resolution that laid out a lot of the goals that came out of the Upper State Street study that uh, Architectural Board of Review and Planning Commission should and will use as they evaluate projects. The guidelines that we'll eventually get to will be much more refined and much more detail-oriented and, and be even more helpful, but they do have something in their toolbox. Understood. So. I just wanted everybody to be on the same page with that. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, yes. I just wanted to encourage you to, um, in your, in your um, written discussion, uh, I think we ought to try this whole thing into the airport as well, eventually, so that we have a, a macro planning system that includes all the way out to the airport and includes um, multimodal forms of transportation so that eventually at some point it all makes sense and we don't start planning this little section and then forget that one out there. Okay. Thank you. I think you just wrote part of them. Thank you very much. Um, we, we'll just take a quick break here. Um, just real quick, stand up and and uh, stretch so they can change. Okay, thanks.
What a difference a day made. Twenty-four little hours brought the sun and the flowers. Where there used to be rain, my yesterday was blue, dear. Today I'm part of you, dear. My lonely nights are through, dear. Since you said you were mine. What a difference a day makes. There's a rainbow before me. Skies above can't be stormy. Since that moment of bliss, that thrilling kiss, it's happened when you find a rose. On your menu, what a difference a day made, and a difference is you. Tus brazos y cuenta los latidos de nuestro Chickadee, and when I kiss you, just say to me, it's delightful, it's delicious, it's lovely. And when I kiss you, just say to me, it's delightful, it's delicious, it's delectable, it's delirious, it's dilemma, it's deluxe, it's delovely.
Improvements. Okay, and I just wanted to make a quick, I, I did check how far Cliff Drive is from my house, and it's beyond the um, the circle that we draw, so I just want people to know, because I don't live that far, but I do live far enough, and that's fine. Okay, and on go that ahead. note, so do I. So, okay, right. same thing. Plus, this is a very long, a bigger project than my house. <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Madam Mayor, Wasier. Council Members, my name is John Awasiak, Principal Civil Engineer for the Public Works Department. And I'm the Streets Capital Manager and the Underground Utility Manager. Uh, I'd like to take a moment just to introduce the Council to my mother, who is visiting here from Canada. It's her first Aww. time in the Council Chambers. Aww. And uh, she's been here every year for 16 years, Aww. and uh, we welcome her nice to the Council son. Chambers. <laughs> Goalie. <laughs> Goalie. When I was a kid. I'm pleased today to give you an update on the Underground Utility District Number 10 Cliff Dive Project and to report on staff's recommendation to add city-funded street lighting improvements as part of the Underground Utility District Project. As I will soon explain, there are limited-use city funds available for city-funded improvements for the project. First, I'd like to give you a brief project overview. As a refresher, on April 22nd of 2006, Council approved Cliff Drive as the next City Underground Utility District. The project boundaries are between Fire Station Number 6 on the east side, just east of Megas Road, west to Mesa Lane. The project is also known as the Southern California Edison, or SCE, Rule 20A project. This means that the funding for this project comes from a portion of the utility bill charges that city residents and owners pay. The project is being designed by SCE, Southern California Edison, and will be out to bid and constructed through an SCE construction contract. There is no obligation of city funds for this project. However, SCE is receptive to having the city add any desired city improvements to their construction contract similar to how they have Verizon and Cox Communication piggyback on their construction contract. Utilization of common trenches is seen as a significant cost savings for any proposed undergrounding related improvements. The SCE project is currently at 30 percent design and on hold until a city decision at this meeting is made as to whether or not the city will propose any additional improvements. In staff's April 20th, 2007 project update memo to council, staff informed the council of an investigation of possible city improvements since this portion of Cliff Drive appears to be under illuminated. The SEE design was viewed as an opportunity to improve the project corridor street lighting, including illuminating pedestrian crossings at intersections that currently have no street lighting. As a result of the city improvements, the project schedule or the, the investigation of the improvements, the project schedule has changed to begin construction in the fall of 2008, as previously as previously compared to what was reported as May 2008 in the uh, memo to council earlier, and the project is estimated to cost 4.5 million dollars. This slide 
shows the existing street lighting, and it's color-coded uh, regarding the who maintains and owns those street lights. The blue on the north side are the Cobra Head street light attachments on the wooden poles that SCE owns and maintains. The green Cobra Head lights on concrete or marble light poles are the city poles that the city maintains. And then the Caltrans orange dots are the intersection uh, signal lights that also have uh, street lighting on them. So again, currently not all the intersections have street lights, uh, as you can see on, on uh, the south side of the street on Cliff Drive. So as noted on the April 20th uh, memo to council, staff subsequently hired an electrical consultant to investigate options and to provide cost estimates for various city improvements. Three, category, three categories of these potential city improvements were identified. I call them minimal, moderate, and full improvement. The minimal improvement being to upgrade the existing street light fixtures from the Cobrahead style to an SCE decorative style subject to the approval of the boards and commissions for an estimated cost of about $12,000. The moderate improvement being to install the conduit infrastructure for future streetlights, utilizing the project's common trench to install additional pull boxes and conduit for a future metered city streetlight system. Also, trenching would be proposed to cross Cliff Drive to accommodate future streetlight locations and this option is estimated to be approximately $200,000. The full improvement option is, uh, includes everything in the moderate option, the second bullet above, but includes converting existing streetlights within the corridor to a city-owned and maintained streetlight system, replacing the existing Cobra Head streetlights in the entire corridor with decorative, decorative street lighting and adding seven new additional streetlights. Further, the existing streetlights along this project corridor would be upgraded with new city fixtures to replace the Cobra heads subject to the boards and uh, city boards and commission approval. The upgraded street lighting system along this corridor would be metered. So the city would only build, be billed for energy that is measured as opposed to the existing more costly SEE flat rated billing system because there are no meters. So this option is estimated to cost approximately $450,000. This slide shows the full improvement upgrade option. And regarding the funding for these proposed city improvements, there are limited use city funds that exist in the underground utility fund. Last year, council approved the transfer of 375,000 from the fiscal year 07 Water Capital Project Fund to the Underground Utility Fund. The transferred funds were an in-lieu contribution to the Underground Utility Fund for removing the undergrounding requir requirement at Yananali Street, you may recall, on an Elastero treatment plant related project. A PC condition of approval, Planning Commission condition of approval, stated that the money is to be used for an undergrounding project within the coastal zone with the intent that the funds be used to augment the, this planned cliff drive project. After analyzing the, the improvement option, staff recommends the full improvements option for the following reasons. The project corridor is deficient in lighting and does not meet our city standards and practices, such as having lighting at intersections. For, Additional street lights will enhance the project corridor, especially at those inter intersections, to embellish pedestrian and alternative modes of transportation in accordance with the city's circulation element. It's opportune to capitalize on the order of magnitude project cost efficiencies by coordinating work on this multi-million dollar project. Common trench savings would result as compared to the city making these improvements separately from this project. And again, limited use city funding mentioned can only be used for an undergrounding project in the coastal zone in accordance with the Planning Commission condition. And no other undergrounding projects in the coastal zone are comp contemplated at this time or in the near future. The project corridor street lighting would be upgraded utilizing new city standard poles and fixtures in, accor in accordance with the preliminary street light design guidelines that are anticipated to be approved by the boards and commissions this fall. 
And this is an important item, is that if no city recommended improvements are made to the corridor, the Southern California Edison replacement lights, since some of those lights are on wooden poles, they'd have to be replaced with Edison lights. Edison would not allow the city to make improvements to those lights for a period of 10 years following the installation of those lights by SCE. This slide is a, an example of a decorative fixture. fixture. You may be familiar with it. It's being used around the cottage hospital area and through other areas of town. And SCE agrees to incorporate any city improvements with their upcoming construction contract in the same manner that they will incorporate the project's Verizon and Cox communications infrastructure improvements. Now, the city will still have the opportunity to either accept or not accept the this bid alternative to the SCE construction contract as part of their construction bid documents. This morning, I received an email from Councilmember uh, Williams regarding uh, the question of if solar could be incorporated into this project. And uh, I want to thank Jane Brown for doing some quick footwork from SCE and, and getting me some information. Uh, there are three issues associated, or three concerns associated with solar at this time and point in time with the technology that's available. Number one is that solar lighting for these types of street lights, the lighting panels would be exposed and they're rather large and cumbersome. And I think we've seen examples of them in past uh, discussions about street lighting. So the technology hasn't advanced to the point where uh, they could be concealed. Uh, those street lights uh, that Ms. Brown shared with me that they are using now have a duration of the three to six hours, so it doesn't seem to meet uh, some of the, the criteria that we'd be looking for for uh, duration of illumination on the street. And then the cost is very significant, and uh, those uh, solar panels that are th the best options that they have at this time are... Uh, 15 to 20 times more costly than, than our city standard lighting and four to five, four to five times more times costly than our decorative style fixtures that we've been proposing. So there are some challenges with silver lighting at this time. As a separate opportunity, staff is proposing to convert two 6.6 .6 amp high voltage streetlight circuits adjacent to the project to conventional low voltage 120 volt circuits. And staff considers this a just do it for the project. These two 6.6 .6 amp circuits are part of approximately 35 citywide 6.6 .6 amp circuit pockets that are planned to be eventually replaced throughout the city. And they are identified in our city's six year uh, capital budget as unfunded uh, need. No, that's what, right. Therefore, it's opportune to add this work to the project. The project, if we didn't convert them, then it would be a $50,000 cost to simply connect to them. So staff has identified a cost uh, of $77,000 to convert these 6.6 .6 amp circuits to low voltage circuits. Plus can I, some. Can, can I just dis sure. uh, interrupt right here, Mr. Uh, uh, our city attorney? Because I, you're, we're looking at my house. What do you think? This is a public improvement. I'm just not sure. Yeah, I can step down or. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Mayor, can I ask Mr. Awaziak, yeah. uh, what would be the effect of converting to the low voltage? The what would people see? What would people notice? Uh, Madam Mayor, city attorney, there would be no visible. Uh, difference that the public would see as uh, when this is improved. It's a matter of the, the amperage and voltage circuitry. <laughs> well, Madam Mayor, I guess the simple answer is my old saying of when in doubt, Bye. sit it out. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, that's well, probably the easiest. Here. Okay. Here you go. Just the easier. Thanks. See you later. Well, that was a rapid promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, when they start moving down the street to the east, that'll be my turn. So. <laughs> Can you continue? Yes, thank you. Uh, some of these costs for this improvement are expected to be recuperated over time, again, as, as the, these will be a metered system as opposed to that flat-rated uh, sis billing system that I, I previously mentioned. So in summary, staff recommends moving forward with the Cliff Drive $450,000 $450, dollars full improvement street light option and the 6.6 .6 amp conversion. Staff has obtained a proposal from the Santa Barbara Electrical Design for 
design services in the amount of twenty four thousand five hundred dollars for the recommended street light upgrade and from steve friesen utility consultant in the amount of two thousand five hundred for the six point six amp conversion design services and these proposals are within the city administrators and public work directors approval authority so that concludes my presentation at this time and available and mr kelly uh, city engineer is available for any questions that you may have we do have one public comment which i would take before uh, questions, if unless you have an urgent question, Kath, Kathy McCammon representing the La Mesa Neighborhood Association. Good afternoon. I'm Kathy McCammon, and I have quickly changed hats this afternoon, and I'm representing our homeowners association, the La Mesa Neighborhood Association. Our association was really pleased when we learned about the undergrounding of the utilities on Cliff Drive. This seemed like a real boon to the Mesa, and it would go a long way to improve the aesthetics of the area. However, we had one little concern, and that was the utility boxes. And I was told to, well, go look at the one behind San Barber Bank and Trust. Well, I did, and it's ugly. But I'm really pleased today to find out that half of the utility boxes will now have to be underground, and the one near the Mesa Shopping Center will be hidden in the landscaping and improvements there. So I'll keep after them to see about the other boxes. But our concern with the boxes was for aesthetic improvements. And so it's very fortuitous that I happen to be here today. I had seen this on the agenda that we're talking about the improved street lights. I think this will be a real addition to enhance our area. And amongst the, the benefits listed, I see even more. I see when we're talking about pedestrian safety, vehicle safety. I mean, one of the biggest problems is people walking around in the dark and they, people might not see them. So having these street lights is a real boon to, I think, safety, will help pedestrians, will help people on their automobile, and for the overall Mesa, will definitely help the appearance of our neighborhood. So I urge that you adopt staff's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. To the council. Councilmember Schneider. Thank you. Well, this is a, an exciting project, and it's one of those incremental steps we're taking to finally taking over Cliff Drive from Caltrans and 225, and this is obviously in the right direction. Um, Mr. Barnwell and I were just whispering over here the, the $375,000 uh, that can be used to to augment the funding to help you know the the funding that's needed the extra funding that's needed for all these improvements. If you may, that was from uh, the Yanonali Street project, which came to council as almost like a fit. You know, we were going to just spend three hundred seventy-five dollars on something because it was passed years and years ago, and and um, when the uh, recycled water facility was still in use and it's not in use anymore and so I was so I'm just it's nice to see where that money is now being so much better spent um, for such a much better uh, community area that's going to impact so many more people in a positive way and and uh, we, we both acknowledge uh, Loretta Red who was a water commissioner at the time who brought that up and she was in the minority vote I think when it brought up to the water commission that's why it came up to council but um, it was her questioning behind it that I think led to us now being able to uh, fund the extra amounts here um, so very different from the last topic we just had about where's the money coming from because that was uh, this is where we're, we're seeing how good planning and thought process of how to spend money show goes up in a long way and in something that's much more uh, visually accept acceptable and also the, the the light pollution because of the design of the street lamps I think is also very important for the whole neighborhood the the lights the light actually will be facing down as opposed to the sky which doesn't need it so I'm very excited about this project thank you council member Barnwell uh, thank you mr. mayor um, it it's, it, it is true we owe a debt of gratitude to Miss Loretta Red for for having not been a rubber stamp committee member 
uh, commission member with all the boards and commissions we have. It's nice to have some independent thinking having gone on because this is a result of that. Um, I, uh, what about, Mr. Waziuk, what about the street light design guideline? Is that going to be coming soon for approval by us? We've got that done, don't we? Uh, pro Tem Mayor Williams, Council Member Barnwell, uh, we are, we're scheduled for our meeting tomorrow, so we're picking the ball up and uh, trying okay. to get to the boards and commissions this fall and ultimately City Council, I believe, by uh, just after the holiday season. So, yes, that ball is uh, moving forward again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I recognize everybody else has some, maybe some other comments, but I'd like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> To the seconder of the motion, Councilmember Falcone. Thank you. I think there were plenty of us, but I'll take it. Um, I'm, I couldn't be more thrilled. I mean, I know there are other neighborhoods uh, in the city that are, are equally deserving, but uh, this is going to be such an incredible boon to that seaside uh, parkway that uh, really people come in from uh, the north and the south and what they see is, is this littering of uh, poles, which we love because it gives us uh, light and all the good stuff that we find we miss so much when the lights go out. Uh, but it really is going to change the entire character of, of that strip of, of uh, parkway. And when we do get it back, when we do get it, in its first instance, from Caltrans, that is going to involve a very long neighborhood conversation, a very big community conversation, because 225, the Highway 225, reaches from Castillo down there on the other side of City College all the way up Cliff Drive to Las Positas all the way up to Modoc. That's Highway 225. And I think that everybody will recognize that there are at least three, probably four, distinct neighborhoods along that entire drive. So what we do there is a long time coming. So I'm very glad we're not waiting for that process to do this, because this will not have to be redone. This will exist from now until the end of time, and we can do whatever it is we want on top of it. Also, the MIGS and Cliff uh, Drive corridor, the corners, are undergoing some redevelopment uh, in, right now. The Mesa Shopping Center is redoing itself. The renderings look very nice. I'm hopeful that although it's inconvenient for those of us who live and, and work there or shop there, uh, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be great. And we're getting a brand new building where there used to be a gas station, which is looking like it's coming along wonderfully, a Geno's Pizza with some mixed-use uh, rental apartments, I believe, with it. So that'll be... Um, That'll be all to the better. So I'm, I'm very encouraged. I want to thank Edison. I want to really thank Jane and, and all the folks at Edison because it's their money. It's Rule 20A money that is put aside on our behalf, but it's a program that lives within the Edison uh, operation. And it's money we wouldn't have otherwise. So I am thrilled, and I wanted to say so on the record, because the next time, as I said, they go beyond the fire station to the east, I'll bet I'm not in this room. So I wanted to put it all out there now. Thank you all very, very much. And, John, you do a great job. And, Pat, thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member House. Well, I'll just add to the kudos here, and thank you very much to our staff for uh, and for the, the thinking that took it to that next level in terms of uh, the city's participation in the, these added lights. Um, and as, as a member of the Planning Commission, and we worked very, very hard to get that consideration of, um, of, of undergrounding the, uh, the, the, the utility lines there in, the, in front of the water treatment plant there, or the, uh, the um, desal plant. That was uh, a big deal to get, but we also, uh, somewhere along the line, somebody in Planning Commission made the wise decision to uh, make sure that the money would have to go in that coastal zone area, or somehow that was a condition of it. I never could have imagined it turning out so well. This is just a great place to do this project and to use those funds. This is just excellent. And um, I've seen, uh, and I want to acknowledge these uh, new improved lights that are along San Andreas. Right, you've been using them there, and uh, and MTDs picked up the theme too with the lighting there um, at their uh, bus shell bus stops along the way, and um, I mean this is just really a great 
just really great thing. And then lastly, the, the going all the way up into the neighborhoods with this, this sort of no-brainer change. Well, it took brains to do that. Thank you very much. Good job. And, uh, Jane, thank you very much uh, for, to Edison. Uh, really appreciate your cooperation with the city and ongoing partnership. Thank you. From my observation, uh, this is one of the neighborhoods that really does have some real dark spots in it. I mean, Lower East Side, Lower West Side, and multifamily neighborhoods just historically have a, an issue with dark spots, and we want to address that. But this had to be in the coastal zone. Uh, and uh, I was just ironically walking uh, neighborhood here last night, and and I think I, I was there late enough that I was scaring a couple people because it was, it was dark at like 7.30 at night, and I mean really dark. Uh, I haven't, haven't gotten that far down the street yet, but I will. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I'm very glad to see this. It's a good use of the funds. Uh, now, will these include the pedestrian overhangs the other the other direction, or no? Or do we th just feel that there's going to be enough ambient light from that? Or Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Pro Tem Mayor uh, Williams, not at this time. Uh, we could evaluate that if if, it, if funds allow. Uh, we're trying to stay within the the budgets. But at this time, no, we haven't uh, haven't got that. But but that's a possibility that we could explore. Well, it'll be an improvement, and we should at least see it because there's also a lot of undergrowth there. So, if in the areas where there is an undergrowth, I'm sure it'll create enough light. But there might be some because of the height. Um, uh, without looking at at maybe adding a couple of them with the pedestrian overhangs. Uh, so we have a motion and a second for both A and B. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Against? Nay? Okay. Motion passes. Item Marty. number 13, pavement maintenance update and design contract. <laughs> Don't worry, Madam Mayor, I'm not too comfortable here. Uh, <laughs> Hal Conklin and Hal Conklin and I have decided long ago that guys weren't meant to be mayors in Santa Barbara. <laughs> 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 We're just making up time, right? That's all. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. John Awasik again, Principal Civil Engineer for the Public Works Department. I'm here today to give you a report on the city's pavement maintenance system and an update on recommended changes to our pavement maintenance strategy. Staff is also recommending to, that council award a contract for the pavement maintenance design services for the next pavement maintenance zone. Here is an outline of the, of the items that I'll talk about regarding the pavement management system report. I'll begin with background information on pavement maintenance then move on to current issues, and then follow up with the revised pavement maintenance strategy. Our city consists of 238 centerline miles, or 510 lane miles, or 40 million square feet of roadway. The city has tracked its road pavement maintenance conditions since 1985. And at that time, the pavement condition index, or PCI as we call it, was an average of 59 out of 100. 100 being a newly paved road and 0 being essentially a dirt road. A PCI of 59 is slightly above the level where costly pavement maintenance, such as an overlay, the, the, the larger lift of 2-inch asphalt that you sometimes see when it creates a bump when you drive over it, a noticeable bump, is required, and that's a costly uh, pavement uh, maintenance effort. Since 1985, the city implemented a strategic pavement maintenance plan based on the proven concept that it's far more cost-effective to proactively maintain streets than to allow the streets to deteriorate to the point of needing significant rehabilitation. This proactive methodology was proven successful in raising the pavement quality of our city streets. Since 1992, the city has achieved its long-standing goal of maintaining a PCI rating of 70 or higher, and the current PCI rating for the city citywide is 71. I would like to point out that 4% of our streets are concrete streets, and concrete pavement maintenance is generally quite expensive, especially concrete, concrete pavement replacement. Replacement is to the tune of about $14 per square foot, 
when you compare that to the 42 cents per square foot that our slurry seal gets us, we get a lot of mileage out of our slurry seal pavement maintenance. And Upper Chapala Street is an example of where we utilize grant funding to address the city concrete streets needs. And we've recently placed rubberized asphalt over that concrete street successfully. And although this may look like a patchwork quilt, some of you may recognize it as our existing uh, pavement maintenance zone map. And it was developed in the late eight, 1980s. Area A is the downtown area, which was last year's slurry seal construction project. And area B is the zone currently in construction. Now zones B through F are, are separated by east side, west side. From the mid 1980s to the mid 1990s, it actually took 10 years to complete the pavement treatment of all the streets within the first six zones. Since that time, we've been on an annual per zone basis of addressing city streets. I'd like to take a moment to tell you uh, about the life cycle of asphalt pavement. And as predictable as death and taxes, one thing certain about pavement maintenance asphalt pavement is that it continues to deteriorate over time. The sun, the rain, traffic loading, and oxidation, oxidization of the pavement contribute to the natural progression of road deterioration. As you can see, a 40% drop in quality of pavement occurs after the first 75% of the pavement life. The next 40% and drop of quality takes place only after 12% of the pavement life. So what this graph shows, it's pay now or pay more later. And a cost-effective solution is timely preventive, timely pavement maintenance. Similar slide that shows the three categories of pavement maintenance. The protect, uh, preventative maintenance, which is our slurry seal program. Then our overlays, which I mentioned is that two or three inch lift of asphalt pavement and then reconstruction, which is a very expensive treatment. So the most cost-effective cost pavement maintenance is our slurry seal. And slurry seal, again, is a thin mixture of small aggregate and pavement oils. And uh, again, it costs approximately 42 cents per square foot to slurry seal. Asphalt overlays are considered more reactive maintenance when it's not practical to slurry seal or cost-effective. Slurry sealing uh, when it is time to overlay a road is much like painting over a badly deteriorated wall. It doesn't solve the problem. And asphalt overlays cost about $3 per square foot. Reconstruction is required when the structure is deteriorated to the point where the road structure has to be rebuilt. And it's a very costly uh, method, and it costs in the neighborhood of $9 per square foot and $14 per square foot for concrete pavement. This slide shows how we proactively maintain the pavement and prevent it from requiring costly reactive pavement maintenance. For our city, we use slurry seal again, and timely slurry sealing uh, prolongs the, the life of the pavement and uh, accelerates the quality. Madam Mayor, may I ask a question on this? Where, because our uh, pavement condition index or whatever you call that is about 71. Where does 71 fall on the uh, x-axis there? Is I would it say be in the vicinity of this right here in the good. Okay. So we're again at the, at the bottom of that is where we try and stay above. So when the road deteriorates then we slurry seal. We actually bring that pavement quality level up. Not quite to the 100% level but it raises it significantly. Then over time it again deteriorates and we slurry seal again and we continue that cycle. And if we're, we're able to continue that cycle uh, well then we don't get into that reactive costly pavement and, maintenance. And if I may, you, you mentioned we Along the bottom line, along the timeline down there, it's a it's approximately ten years between the building of the road and when it needs a slurry seal. Did I hear you say that, or um, Madam Mayor and Council Member Barnwell, This time frame for the city, this curve is approximately thirty five years to, for the life of a of a pavement in this city. The national average is more like twenty five years, but because we have uh, better weather, 
uh, our pavements are actually benefit from that, and we have uh, we have learned that the extension their pavement lives get extended due to better weather. Rain is one of the the primary um, accelerants of deterioration. So at the end of 35 years, we got to redo the roadbed. If the story seal nothing, doesn't work. That's correct. If we did okay. nothing to the pavement, then in approximately th we would that's the life expectancy of, of a road without gotcha. maintenance. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Madam Mayor. This slide shows our city's pavement condition index tracked over time. And the city has a longstanding goal of keeping our pavement condition index above 70 to prevent that costly uh, pavement maintenance. From 1985 to 1996, our budget records show that the city spent an average of $3.2 million per year on pavement maintenance in response to complaints from citizens regarding deteriorated streets. You may recall it was at 59 in 19, PCI 59 in 1985. Now this $3.2 million in 1985 equates to approximately $8.2 million in today's dollars. So since 1996, the city has been able to budget an average of $2.2 million a year. And this is a testament to the effectiveness of what our pavement maintenance strategies. So this reduction in, pavement, in budgeting of pavement maintenance funds has also allowed us to budget for uh, other items such as alternative transportation and uh, other capital projects. Now this year's pavement maintenance budget is $1.95 million. However, next year in fiscal year 09, our budget is $2.76 million, as we've uh, shown to council in the budget documents. But it includes $864,000 of Proposition 42, that's the state gas tax, grant funds that we are confident that we will receive from the state this next year. Now the citywide PCI has dropped from its peak of 75 in 1996 to its current level of 71. So moving on to current issues, one significant item is that slurry seal prices have increased over 50% in the last two years due to the petroleum uh, price increases. And as a result of increased material costs and reduced funds budgeted for the program, less pavement maintenance work has been achieved. So staff estimates that $4 million per year in today's dollars is needed to maintain existing streets and maintain a goal, a city goal of, of 70. So as presented to council and by staff earlier this year with our fiscal year 08 budget discussions and with our Measure D uh, program of projects, the streets maintenance operations and alternative, pro alternative transportation programs compete with our streets capital programs that include pavement maintenance. So limited available city funds and decreasing material, increasing material costs are putting a strain on maintaining the current pavement PCI. Another issue is the fact that the Measure D funding, our regional half percent sales tax, will sunset in 2010, and the next Measure D renewal vote is slated for November 2008. Staff will pursue alternative funding sources such as state or federal grants as they become available. Don't want you to be too alarmed by this slide. It's just a slide that, would, that shows you what would happen to our PCI level if we maintain the current level of funding of that average of $2.2 million per year. And staff doesn't intend to do that. I want you to know that. But this slide was shown at the August 1st South County Measure D Renewal Committee meeting. And again, uh, we're not anticipating that this, this will happen, but I just wanted to give you that, that information. So as previously stated, next year we're in their budget is $2.7 million. And that 2.7 and this year's $1.95 million for fiscal year 08 does not include the Prop 1B funds that we are now expecting this year. This morning I just confirmed with the League of California Cities that we will in fact be getting Prop 1B funds this year, uh, a lot more than we anticipated. Um, now Proposition 1B is one of our four state bond measures. Prop 1B would dedicate $20 billion for statewide road repairs, congestion, 
congestion reduction, bridge repair, expanded transit, public transit, and port security. But of this amount, cities and counties would receive $1 billion for local street and road improvements. Our city is expected to receive a total of $2.8 million from Prop 1B. Me. And the state is telling us that we can expect to receive half that amount, or $1.4 million this year. So that was, that was new and, and welcome news to us, that more funds are available. So the state has not disclosed how or when the remaining approximate $1.4 million will be allocated. And the Prop 1B funds were not included in the fiscal year 0809, as at that time there was no assurance from the state as to when or how we would be getting those monies. Note on this uh, chart that the GASB 34 line is at a PCI of 60. Now, GASB, G-A-S-B, stands for Governmental Accounting Standards Board. And under the GASB State 24 regulations, municipalities are required to account for and report infrastructure capital assets. A few years ago, the city selected a PCI of 60 as that desired condition level. As previously explained, when we get below a level of 60, then we get into more costly uh, pavement preventative maintenance or pavement maintenance. On to the revised pavement maintenance strategy. The past pavement maintenance strategy has been to apply at least the slurry seal treatment to every street within a pavement maintenance zone each year. Until a few years ago, the available pavement maintenance funds were sufficient to accomplish this. However, increased costs currently do not allow road maintenance for every street within a zone. Further, because arterial streets receive more use, they require more maintenance. For the current slurry seal construction contract, which is Area B, we are now only able to slurry seal about 50% of our streets within that zone. The revised strategy is to have a fr higher frequency of maintenance on the more traveled arterial streets where most bus routes and bike lanes are located. The road conditions affect more users more often. With this philosophy, the more widely used arterial streets, which require the more frequent maintenance, would become their own pavement maintenance zones. This results in changing from six citywide pavement zones to seven. Two zones are proposed to be arterial streets and five zones proposed to be uh, residential streets. And this map illustrates that. Again, zone one would correspond generally to uh, area A, uh, two is in the vicinity of area C, and so on, five uh, zones in the city. Now, the lines in blue are the arterial streets within the city, and they are proposed to be two separate pavement maintenance zones. The residential zones area are divided virtually equally, and um, the arterial zones are slightly less um, in size, but uh, are comparable in size between the two arterial zones. So staff proposes that the two arterial zones be on a four to six year maintenance cycle, similar to what we have currently, which is a six year maintenance cycle, and that the residential zones be on an eight to year, eight to 10 year maintenance cycle, as they don't receive as much uh, loading and traffic in use. And so to differentiate between the prior new zone naming convention, staff would implement a new zone numbering system. And since zone two uh, incorporates the majority of the next zone, which is zone C, to be done, it was the logical choice to be the next pavement maintenance zone. And the proposed seven zones appear to be the optimal number of zones considering the criteria for limited funding, road category maintenance needs, and proposed frequency of pavement treatment. And we had uh, several mathematical iterations to, to look at what would be frequencies of having different numbers of zones. And so seven was the optimum that we came up with. I'd like to move on to the, uh, one of the recommendations for us to, to, for council to award a construction con design, con I'm sorry, not construction, but a design contract. Annually, the city awards a pavement design contract for the next pavement maintenance zone. The design consultant performs a detailed pavement condition assessment and typically, they identify portions of the roads that require pavement repairs, such as crack sealing, pothole digouts, in preparation for, for the slurry seal work. And this type of work is on, currently ongoing, and is, you can see it, uh, evidence of it at the Creo Hill and, and Las Positas. Staff anticipates a smooth transition from the 
former pavement zone system to the revised pavement zone system. And Flowers and Associates has expertise in the road pavement design as one of our city's pre-qualified engineering consultants. In summary, staff's pavement maintenance strategy is proposed to maximize the use of available pavement funding. The updated strategy includes a goal that available funds be designated to the highest need. The proposed seven pavement maintenance zones and continued pavement preventative pavement treatment are proposed to accomplish this. So, and also staff is recommending council authorize the public works director to award a professional services design contract with Flowers and Associates in the total of $63,000, $63,697 for pavement design for the next pavement maintenance zone. And that concludes my presentation and be happy to answer questions that you may have. Mr. Williams? Could you put the one of the area maps back up there? <clears throat> because I the que one question is so the next one up after this year yeah. would be area two which is now area mostly C right yes let me let me go okay here's uh, we had just last year we completed zone one and this year we're working on area B so comparison we have B situated just outside of, of area A so next year, we have Zone C over here, the, the majority of Zone C over here, and a portion of Zone C in this vicinity. So when we go to the new system, you can see that we would be looking at an, a larger previous Zone C as Area 2. And the obvious question may be, what about this area next year? And the answer is, is that when we do zone, zone 2, we still don't have enough money to do every street. We would analyze the greatest need outside of zone two at the same time. So if there was a, a street or streets in the former zone C that needs preventative maintenance that is higher than, than in the, the area of zone two, then we would do that as well. It is not uncommon for us to go outside of a zone at any time in any year to address the, the higher needs, such as we are doing at Las Positas Road this year. Yeah. Okay. Can you also put the last one? Up? I, I agree with the, the approach. I think it's a good approach. The only thing I would caution is occasionally there's uh, folks that, I don't know, maybe we missed last time around in, in Area C. I, ironically, I've also been walking this area, <laughs> and folks um, there say they, they've been missed for, you know, 20, 30 years. Now, in my experience, 20, 30 years usually means 10. Uh, in in, rea in reality, so 2030 in people's perception means 10 in reality, but that still means we probably missed them the last time around. And yeah. so I would just put your attention to, to, that area. to that area. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Um, oh, Ms. Falcone. And then we'll go down the line now. Thank you. Um, I uh, have to tell you, this gives me a little bit of consternation here. I'm just so uneasy about spreading this out into more years. I understand and agree totally that the arterials need more attention. I mean, that's quite obvious and common sense. But I look at the data that you've given us here and just remember, you know, my own experiences as well and have seen what has happened in the county uh, over the time that we have had Measure D, and they have not. Uh, the roads in, in the county have deteriorated exponentially faster than ours because we had the money to do it. But if we're looking at a scenario where we may or may not convince the voters to pass a version of Measure D this time around in 08, I guess that's when we're looking at it, and you look at the data that says in 1985, this PIC rating was at a 59. And what people have experienced for the last 15 years or better has been upwards of 71 to 75. I'm not quite sure that they're ready to go back to the mid-60s or lower. 
So I, I understand the economics quite clearly. I was under the impression that the state had held back some of the money from 1B and was only going to eke it out in smaller portions than you mentioned. But uh, the 1 billion to counties and cities collectively, I think, is is what we can what we can expect. And we get a little more than the counties. We get. 600 and they get 400 or something along that line. At any rate, I'm glad to hear it's coming soon, that portion of it. There should be a lot more coming, but of course they're balancing their budget with part of that money. So if we can look at a program that maybe doesn't take the residences down quite as far, eight to ten years, just makes me squirrely. I'm sorry. You know, it just doesn't quite fit with what I think the maintenance needs are here. Yes, we have better weather, but we also have erosion. And as a back east girl, I know that one of the, and a mountain, you know, living in the mountains for a dozen years, I know that salt is probably one of the worst things you can have. Now, we didn't allow salt in Tahoe, but you can't tell Mother Nature not to dump salt all over Santa Barbara. So um, I just, I, I'm uneasy. I, I'll, I'll, uh, very likely go with the recommendation, but I have to tell you, I'm, I'm uneasy with these numbers, especially when there's more money to be had from the state and possibly other places. I'm not quite sure we want to codify and put into, you know, an absolute system that we're not going to maintain at a slightly higher level than what's being recommended. So those are my two cents. Mr. House? Uh, could you go to the slide that showed the um, the average uh, at se about 71 or at 71 percent? It was, I think, one of your first slides that showed the. Uh, well, it's even that. Let's see. So we're so we're at 71 percent there now. If that were um, a, a modal chart and showed the um, half of the streets below and half of the streets above, what, where would we stand? I mean, how would how'd that look? Madam Mayor, Council Member House, uh, we do have a, a report, a detailed report, that actually shows the condition of the streets overall in the city. I can refer to it for maybe a quick answer. Um, all streets in the city with our rating of 71, uh, it looks like the extreme majority is at 61 or higher. We have uh, over 70, we actually have 40, 60. Almost 70 percent of our roads are at 70 or higher. Okay. Over, overall in the city. Does then, that help? Does that answer your question? That's helpful. Yes. So, but that would mean then like 30 percent are below. That's correct. And um, so, when you go to, into each one of the zones, are you then prioritizing the streets mm -hmm. in each one of those zones, like on a case by case, street by street basis, as to their particular condition at, at the given time, or I mean? Uh, or, or I mean, how, how precise is your is your um, prioritizing when you get into each of the zones? Then, Madam Mayor, Council Member House, the the strategy of pavement maintenance is to preserve your your best streets first. It's an interesting concept. You you mm -hmm. you feel like uh, really what about the the ones that are lower? But again, you've got to recognize, or it should be recognized that. Uh, slurry seal is that preventive maintenance tool that we use, and it's only cost effective to be used on roads that are mm. above a level where it is effective. As you showed us in that one chart there before. Okay, so then, then in a way it goes a little bit, to, this, is, this is the concern that I, I would like to address. It goes a little to the, what was brought up a moment or two ago, and that was um, there are uh, areas of town that, that where the streets have gotten pretty bad, and they're probably below that level where you'd use the slurry seal. But it's not within our budget to do the overlay that's really required. So those neighborhoods or those streets that are really bad, kind of, I'm mean, talking about the forgotten stepchild. And you know, it's, they, they get put back and back. How, how are we going to deal with that? Madam Mayor, uh, mm -hmm. Council Member House, that's a great question, and, and I have an answer for that. Good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> In our P3, our performance measures, as Mr. Armstrong uh, may know, that we have a P3 performance measure to address that concern, which is that we will have not forgotten about the low-end need, uh, or that lower-scale need. And so we have in our performance measures uh, an objective to include 
streets at the lower level in so we so we don't just deal with those streets that are that are sixty p c i and higher we actually do address a portion of the streets we just don't have enough funds to address them all but at least we do make an attempt and we have in the last couple years succeeded in and prioritizing some streets where we can be cost effective and include them in our pavement maintenance design so and and another thing is that um, a lot of the low end is are the concrete streets and we look for those grant funding opportunities many of the low uh, say a concrete street in 40 is is not a failing street structurally it is intact it probably doesn't look very good uh, aesthetically but structurally it's fine so so we don't um, we don't proactively maintain those as well. So those are two ways that we look at streets below a PCI of, of uh, 60 and, and not ignore them. There's um, a significant difference in terms of your uh, experience of a street between those that have been slurry sealed over a number of years or even recently and um, and driving on that stretch of Chapala that was recently done, or Hollister out in front of Elephant Bar, or even Cannon Perdido, which was done a few years ago, right? I mean, there's still, they really are different to ride along on those streets. And um, I, I just want to put an idea out there, and maybe I'm sure you've discussed this, but and that is that we really set a site, set a, a much higher goal recognizing that practically speaking with our current budget situation with all that that we can't possibly attain it but that its purpose would be to um, prepare us for the opportunity when a grant were to if it were to come along or not so that we've actually established for Santa Barbara the uh, that Chapala Street from you know from Mission to Alamar or whatever that, that that's the that that's the standard that we're really attempting to achieve here in the city for all of our streets or uh, some higher percentage than we have now because um, um, I mean it's, it's really something when you go to a community where they've managed to have the resources to do that yeah. and I think that Santa Barbara would think of itself as the kind of town that would have those resources but when you ride along our streets they're pretty you know bumpy in a lot of places and there's a lot of cracks and the most and, and, and fairly recently sealed streets uh, maybe a year or two later you'll start to see those cracks appear again and you know that that's not the real the true fix so I would like us I don't know what what the right venue is maybe at that infrastructure committee meeting or group that you're forming uh, Jim um, but we really get that that identified as to what our real higher goal would be and uh, and um, adopt that perhaps as a as a, as our overarching, maybe not immediately achievable, but our, our vision, if you will. Uh, you know, I put that out there for discussion. Madam Mayor, yes, Council Member House, uh, you mentioned one thing about uh, us being ready for grant monies. We actually do have a design on the shelf for some concrete streets that, when grant funding becomes available, we hope to be first in line Good. because our design is complete and we're waiting. And it's actually part of grant funding we were expecting to get that didn't get. We didn't get. Due to the state. Uh, Thank you. That's so. really in the spirit of what I'm talking about. And I'm thinking of it from a citywide perspective, of course. You'd have to prioritize, but that's the spirit of it. Okay, Mr. Horton. Uh, Mr. John, back on the concrete streets for just a bit. The, my neighborhood on the Riviera is concrete. And a lot of those streets are in, in pretty bad shape as far as lifting and cracks and weeds growing and so on. And, and I get a lot of questions from my neighbors on this. Uh, it, I, I heard you say that there's grant uh, projects lined up, but is there a long-term uh, way of working with these streets? Or are you just going to use asphalt to seal them until you get a grant? Or you know, what's your say five-year goal for that? Madam Mayor, Councilmember Horton, uh, our concrete streets really are rather long-term goal rather than sh within a say a five-year goal even but we we still as I mentioned uh, recognize the need for some of the, the concrete streets that are in the worst condition and we're always looking for those grant fund opportunities and we may foresee some of them in the nearer future as well so um, again treatment of a uh, failing concrete street is costly and we've uh, trying to uh, utilize our rubberized pavement asphalt pavement as the method like we did on Chapala and then it kicks us into a asphalt pavement where we do have 
program funds to maintain. So that is part of our strategy. Uh, rubberized asphalt pavement does have its limitations, and, and on steep inclines, uh, it has its challenges and, and isn't recommended for some streets. So we have design challenges, but, but your, to answer your question is that we're trying to proactively get those concrete streets on, with rubber asphalt. Uh, it's more expensive, but uh, it's in our thoughts. Okay, Ms. Schneider and then Ms. Falcone. Sure. Thank you. I, I agree with Council Member Falcone that it makes gives me the kind of heebie-jeebies about what this means long term. But I think you've taken the money that we have and done the best in terms of rearranging it so that we don't get into a worse situation later. Uh, Chapala Street from Mission to Alamar was was a grant funding, and I remember it took a little longer because we had to wait a few years to finally get the money that we were promised. Um, in the past, and I can tell you the neighbors are very happy now with, with that change and what a difference that makes. Could you go to the slide uh, that was the worst case funding scenario that I know will never happen, but you put it up there anyway? <laughs> that one, yeah. Um, I mean, certainly w without Measure D, we, we get very bad very soon, and, and that, so it's, uh, that, it's just another informational piece about how important Measure D is countywide and and, uh, and and how that needs to be allocated out and, and continued beyond the expiration date of 2010. But but even even with the current funding level with Measure D, we still go down this precipice pretty quickly. And um, I know Council Member House brought up what I was thinking also of the investment, the um, capital improvement process. Is this in the capital improvement plan, the six-year plan that Mr. Armstrong is, are actual streets like the big concrete streets or other pieces in a section? I can't remember. Um, you know, do you know what I'm talking, the, in, in the document that we were looking at in terms of unfunded and funded capital projects, are there specific streets that are concrete streets that need overlays versus other that are slurry seals, or is that in that, in that document? Madam Mayor, yeah. Council Member Snyder, no, they are grouped together as city streets that okay, are so separated city, from concrete and, and uh, Because it might, I mean, as you mentioned with funding, grant funding and other funding, and then there's ongoing operational costs and streets funds, there might be two different scenarios here that we have in terms of slurry sealing to maintain the streets we have so they don't deteriorate fast. And then there's a whole other section of f trying to find those other grants. And um, But we're, it, I mean, even with Measure D, which is important, we're going to have to figure out another way of trying to fund this into the, in the long run. I mean, so, so that's... Madam Mayor, <laughs> Madam Mayor, Council Member Schneider, you know, help is on the way with the, with the Prop 1B that, that we just learned that we'll be getting a significant boost with those funds. And, and we are, the state, uh, the state seems more, there are more uh, opportunities right now. The climate is better right now. And so, but the the one B funding is sort of a one-time boost, though. That's not an ongoing funding augmentation, or is it? That's correct. It, it's... Uh, it's not long term, right? Yeah. So I guess I, I'm just I guess thinking, trying to think more long term about what what this means for us in terms of our infrastructure long term and, and how we fund it. Yeah, you know, and um, mm -hmm. Mayor Bloom and members of the council, um, when I saw this chart last week and I called up uh, John and Pat and we had a rather lengthy discussion <laughs> because it, it is very concerning and one it shows you what the challenge that not just Santa Barbara has, but everybody has, because actually we're putting more money, I think, into a street program than, than most cities in the state. And, the, and then the fact that with the cost of oil going up, right. you know, the cost of the materials we use have gone, has gone up 50% in the last two years, which just blows away our planning process. It just blows it away. And I mean, and it, you should be very concerned about this because, and then the discussion we had is how, how many years can you slurry seal a street or how many times? And at some point, you know, I don't think it goes all the way back up to 100. But, you know, at some point we're going to have to overlay some of these streets, you know, after the fourth or fifth time we slurry seal them. So, I mean, long term it's really a serious issue. And, and then with all the other competing um, priorities we have to fund transit, because we're funding that out of Measure D, um, and some of the other things that are going on, um, you know, when we take over 225, and I'm sure that we'll have, you know, ambitious plans to, to make that a, a more attractive street, um, the, it's, it's something to be concerned about. I think we're ahead of the curve, at least in looking at it. I think having that infrastructure finance committee, but I think it also shows you what we need to do at a state and federal level to get 
more money into the system for maintaining the, the street system because it just it's it's not enough in the long term. Well, well, I look forward to that infrastructure finance scheduling and it coming back and looking at that long term goal. But because I mean, this is one of many, many, many infrastructure projects that we know we have um, that's coming, and we need to figure think long term. So, uh, I appreciate all the thought that you put into this, and uh, I'll, I'll just um, go ahead and move recommendations A and B. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Ms. Falcone, do you have last thing to add? I just have one last gasp here, and that mm -hmm. is um, part of what we can all do, and it's not just the elected officials, but it's also people can do, is contact your legislators, contact your neighbors, contact your friends down in a different district's legislatures, and, and both at the Assembly and at the Senate, because we have two mechanisms, Prop 42, where we have not gotten our allocated share for years and years and years, and it was only by really forcing it that last year and hopefully this year and in subsequent years we will continue to get our, our fair share of what that money, the money that's due to us that was promised, that's why the voters passed these things. The same thing with Proposition 1B, and the legislature is already fully playing around with the money, balancing their own budgets with money that was supposed to come to local governments, to cities and states, and that's why the people of the state of California voted for Proposition 1B. It was all earmarked and targeted toward infrastructure, and there were earmarks out there for specific local government, either cities or counties, and, and that is, is the machinations that are going on. So really, what has to be done is the state has to give us the fair share that the people thought they were voting for. A, there's money we're not getting that we should. B, Measure D, this is like alphabet soup, but Measure D is not just about whether you like trains or not, it's about whether you like to drive on roads that are decent and aren't going to cause you to go in for mechanical changes, whether or not you want to bounce off the head of a, of, of a bus. I mean, I get a little passionate about this, but the rationale for not passing Measure D is really not particularly well thought out. Measure D is a mechanism that has caused us to have some of the better roads in the county, in the area, and you know when you leave the city because you start to dip into holes and things start to crack and your car starts to bounce. And that's because they're not self help counties, we need to continue to be one of those. The other thing I wanted to mention was the California Integrated Waste Management Board, which de deals with old manner of trash in the state. And uh, how that comes into this is, is here. They are in the process of defining and producing and marketing a whole host of materials for a whole lot of reasons that are made out of recycled materials. One of or two of those products are for paving purposes. Now, we have a problem here in Santa Barbara that our projects aren't large enough to access their grants. We have, I have, and I know that some others have, asked them to really look at that through various meetings that we've had here in the city and in other places, to look at that and really say that we are going to redefine our grant uh, parameters so that smaller jurisdictions can take advantage of some of these products, because otherwise we can't access them. So it takes all of us to work together. It takes multiple jurisdictions to work together to try to get some of these things ironed out. But to just say we don't have the money and then we're not going to pave as often, I, I think there are more creative ways to go about it. In the interim, that's fine. I mean, we're here and we have to do that. But we need to get really creative and assertive with the state and with getting the Integrated Waste Management Board to change their grant parameters so that not just us but lots of other jurisdictions can take advantage of these recycled products. I mean, that's the wave of the future. So I'd like to engage all of your help in, in uh, going forward and doing that at these various different levels. And that's my last rant, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second, but we have Mr. Williams who wants to say one thing. Well, there's one other thing that people can do to make roads last longer, which is to drive on them less. <laughs> um, uh, they, you know, you, you would think that they just wear out at the same amount of, of, of time, but they don't. Uh, the more weight and the more often that weight is put on these roads, the more stress that they have and the, and the quicker they deteriorate. So um, remember, folks, it's not... You don't have to give up the car, but giving up the car once or twice a week um, really can make a difference. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Item 14, please. 
Item number 14, appeal of the Historic Landmarks Commission decision regarding the residents at 1849 Mission Ridge Road and the city's list of potential historic resources. Okay, and the way appeals go is that the presentation is first by the, the staff, and city staff, and then by the appellant, and then by the applicant. Where did everyone go? I don't know. Everybody left. <laughs> Not everybody left. We're here. <laughs> We still have four of us. I know Mr. Clark wants to speak before Trevor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we will start with city staff. Mr. Jacobus. Oops, Mr. Lamone. Whoever. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. In October of 2004, the City Council. Oh, see. The City Council directed planning staff to review and update the City of Santa Barbara's potential historic structures and site list as a part of the adoption of the Demolition Review Ordinance. The vast majority of the 593 properties that are on the potential list um, let's see, were, were put on the potential list as a result of uh, historic surveys that the City undertook in the late 1970s and early 1980s. However, staff identified 100 properties that were not placed on the list as a result of an historic survey. After receiving notice regarding the potential list update, several property owners requested in writing that their properties be removed from the list, the applicant being one, or should say the appellant being one. As a result of the process, 33 properties were identified as being on the list in error and removed from the list. The appellant submitted a letter requesting his house at 1849 Mission Ridge Road be removed from the list. This letter, drafted by Trevor Martinson, on the behalf of the Clarks was received by the city on January 1, 2007. The Historic Landmarks Commission held a series of public hearings regarding the potential list beginning on February 8, 2007. At that meeting, they reviewed a total of 40 properties which were identified as staff as being questionable. At the meeting, the HLC identified 32 properties that should be removed from the list and created a subcommittee to review the remaining eight properties and three additional properties that were added by staff for a total of 11 properties. On March 28, 2007, the HLC subcommittee held a public hearing where it took testimony from the affected property owners. Of the 11 properties reviewed, the subcommittee voted to remove only one. The subcommittee voted to recommend to the full commission that the house at 1849 Mission Ridge Road remain on the list. The full HLC met on May 2nd to consider the recommendations of the subcommittee and voted unanimously to keep the house at 1849 Mission Ridge Road on the potential list. The appellant filed an appeal with the, uh, to the City Council on May 14th requesting that the City Council overturn the Historic Landmarks Commission's decision to keep the house at 1849 Mission Ridge Road on the potential list. The house was designed by significant architect George Washington Smith and completed in 1923. This house is a superb example of the Spanish colonial revival style of architecture as interpreted by Smith. All the photographs for this presentation were taken from the public right away showing how the general public would view the house. This house is a study in massing and the use of subtle detail achieved to achieve an elegant result. Details are only added where needed. In this case, the chimney cap is a good example. The appellant cites the following issues for the reason for his appeal. First, that the appellant's letter, the first, the appellant's letter, appeal letter states that CEQA guidelines section 15169 does not ap appear to allow historic structures and sites to be included in the guideline parameters and that they are not environmental in context according to section 51, 15169. The appellant's appeal letter also states that significant financial impacts are cast upon any structure which is designated in a historic structure or site, and no compensation is given by the city for designation. Finally, in an earlier letter to staff, the appellant states that the house has undergone numerous alterations which would keep the house from qualifying as for historic designation. In response, staff offers the following. CEQA section 15169A states that a public agency may prepare a master environmental assessment, inventory, or database of all or a portion of the territory subject to its control, 
And Section 15169B provides that a master environmental assessment may contain an inventory of physical or biological characteristics of the area for which it is prepared and may contain such additional data and information as the public agency determines is useful or necessary to describe the environmental characteristics of the area. CEQA Section 15360 defines environment as the physical conditions which exist in the area that will be affected by a proposed project, including land, air, water, minerals, flora, fauna, ambient noise, and objects of historical and aesthetic significance. This section further states that the environment contains both natural and man-made conditions. It is staff's position that these sections of CEQA allow the creation and maintenance of the City of Santa Barbara Potential Historic Structures and Sites list. There's no documented evidence to support the appellant's position that being placed on the city's potential historic list will cause a financial hardship. Additionally, Mr. Martin's appeal letter refers to financial hardship based on the owners of designated historic structures or sites. Although placing a structure on the potential list does not constitute a formal historic designation, it does require future um, significant exterior alterations to be reviewed by the Historic Landmarks Commission as part of the new demolition review ordinance. However, under the city's demolition review ordinance, a proposed significant alteration to this house would require HLC uh, approval regardless of whether it was on the potential list or not because we would ask for an historic structures report. The potential list is an important planning resource inventory of potential historic structures that are eligible for possible future designation. It's essentially a watchdog list. Um, the city has no intent of going through that list currently and starting to designate properties without owner's consent. We've always with uh, very few exceptions, have always had owner's consent in order to do so. I've seen articles in journals and newspapers which attribute positive rather than negative financial effects on historically designated properties. Just a couple of weeks ago, this article appeared in the Los Angeles Times. It highlights the benefits of designating neighborhoods as historic preservation overlay zones. At the bottom, you can see that it says, more residents seek historic label to preserve home prices. In a letter to the city dated January 30th, 2007, Mr. Martinson argues that there have been significant number of alterations made to the house over the years, which in his opinion would prevent the house from qualifying for historic designation. Staff disagrees. The majority of the alterations occurred on the rear elevation and are not visible from the street. Here we have a comparison photograph of two photographs taken, one in 1928 on the left, the other in 2007 on the right. You can see you can see some differences. Here's a lean-to mm -hmm. portion of the rear addition that shows up that's not on the original house. We have, originally we had these exterior curtains where we now have some metal grates, very nicely done metal grates, by the way. Mm -hmm. Here we see a, a lamp that's not on the original. But, I mean, the integrity's there. For the most part, that house, it would take a trained eye to start to see the differences between that and uh, between those two photos. Here we see a different view of the front of the house, and you can see this window here was originally an open sleeping porch, which has been enclosed to make some sort of interior space. The back of the house is where most of the alterations have taken place. We can see down here that the original garage was enclosed to make living space. There's a new carport which replaces the garage, and this is a fairly large addition of a, a den or family room that was put on the back of the house. Um, however, most of these... Um, Changes that you see here meet the Secretary of the Interior standards. They are to the rear of the house. They don't affect most of the public views that you have of the house. Here's what the back of the house originally looked like. This was originally, where's the arrow go? There it is. This was originally an open courtyard in here, which has now been enclosed to create this interior space. Most of the, what you see from the back can only be seen from a small portion of an opening in the wall for the drive court. Most of the uh, backyard is hidden by this um, wall that surrounds the property. Staff's recommendation is that council deny the appeal filed by Trevor Martinson of the Historic Landmarks Commission's decision regarding property owned by Dr. and Mrs. John Clark, located at 1849 Mission Ridge Road, and uphold the Historic Landmarks Commission's decision to deny the owner's request to remove the subject property from the city's potential historic structures and sites list. That concludes staff's report. Okay, thank you. And we'll hear now from the appellant. I need to move these buttons down. Uh, yeah, Dr. Clark, let me just turn that microphone there. Thanks. There you go. Thank you. 
question. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, my wife and I thank you very much for hearing our appeal to have our residents removed from this potential list of historic landmark structures in this city. Our home is actually a relatively small townhouse built by two spinster sisters over 75 years ago, and we've lived here since 1969. I'm basing our appeal on several factors. First of all, you've heard one side of the story that uh, not much shows in wave remodels. I would um, uh, contrast that with the people who have visited our home and noted considerable changes. There's been two uh, very extensive remodels over the years, and admittedly the front facade has not been changed. We did not wish to, but uh, all of the construction is on the west and south sides. Uh, these have been described. On the west side, there was a broken down asphalt uh, driveway which has been replaced by uh, nice aggregate concrete. There was an open air shed that has been rebuilt into a garage and workshop. There's a three-car carport, uh, many other structures, which are listed in my letter uh, to uh, the uh, landmarks or the uh, um, HLC uh, in uh, January. And on the uh, south side, we did indeed take the old garage that was used for Model Ts and things like that, and incorporate part of our uh, basement into a large guest suite. And there's an outdoor patio. But the major change has been on the south side and is very visible to anyone walking or driving up San Carlos Street, and that is uh, the incorporation of a two-story steel and glass walled structure with, uh, of course, a large roof. Uh, it steps down onto a 30 or 40 foot diameter semicircular uh, patio with um, uh, 18 inch uh, support, 18 inch thick support walls um, to uh, blend it into the into the garden. Um, these are all listed in my uh, letter of January the 30th, and um, I uh, won't go into any more details. There actually are uh, 13 or 14 uh, aspects, and I'm only hitting on a few. Um, it's been mentioned that these are not very significant. Well, they certainly are. I've had a number of guests and uh, professional people come by our home and uh, they all say, my goodness, this is, this is really wonderful, but I bet you anything that the original architect wouldn't recognize these changes. He might recognize the front of the house, but that's all. The fact that these were made um, now, uh, and again, I'm going to argue, argue with the uh, uh, staff, uh, these uh, do change the um, features of the house sufficiently that it no longer would meet federal guidelines for historic structure. And this fact alone should automatically exclude our house from the city's list. So this is one factor. Number two, houses have a life. They evolve and they change as the needs of owners change. When our house is eventually sold, the new occupants may wish to make modifications to match their requirements. With the designation of a potential historic landmark, permission for alterations would become much more difficult to obtain. Many review boards in the city would greatly affect the outcome and the needs of the new owners. There could be huge fees levied with months and months of delays as the staff, the ABR, the single family design board, the historic landmarks commissions, and its tiers of consultants in archeology, span history, and Chumash studies review the project. This may also require the modification officer and even a planning commission review or possibly even an environmental impact. All of these uh, are hurdles and very expensive ones, which of course in the city, you people are happy with that as owners uh, and potential owners of the house, this is extremely distressing. Number three, house value. All of this greatly affects the value of the house. Who would want to purchase a house then face these roadblocks blocks, and expenses involved in obtaining or not obtaining the permits to make an improvement? Financial magazines, and I differ here with the staff, financial magazines such as Money and Kiplinger have outright 
warn people not to buy a house with such restrictions because the sale of such a house eventually will potentially take many, many months longer and probably result in a significantly reduced price to the owner. And this has already occurred in one landmark house. Four, cost of homeowner's insurance. The city has assured everyone that having a house on list should not cost anyone a penny extra. This is not so. Our homeowner's insurance agent has warned us that next spring, when it comes to getting a new homeowner's policy, our rates will go up at least 30%. That amounts to over $3,000 over and above what we're already paying, 30%, $3,000 if we can get a homeowner's policy because they're treating all these homes in now and in the future as if they were landmark structures. Not only that, we have been told that there is going, to, there's going to be only one homeowner's carrier who will have any interest in insuring our property, not the usual three or four that is the customary. <coughs> Number five, the number of historic structures on the list. Currently, the County of Santa Barbara, huge place, has a list of approximately 60 structures on a list not related to the CEQA, CEQA umbrella. The, 60 ha the city has over 600 structures on their list, and from our understanding, it has plans to include all homes over the age of 50. Now, assuming that there are 14,000 residences in the city, about 10,000 would fit into that category of being over 50 years. And they for, therefore, they will soon be added to this expanded list. Every homeowner uh, will suffer from the added expenses that face us. Imagine the potential voters this will impact, each facing the additional two to $3,000 yearly increase in homeowner insurance. This amounts to millions of dollars of wasted, unnecessary expense for city residents. This fact will certainly cause serious concerns amongst homeowners once it becomes public knowledge. Number six, CEQA. The final area for discussion relates to the city staff of the section 15169 of the California Environmental Quality Act to create and justify this list of potential and designated structures of merit and landmarks. How many of you have actually read this act? Yeah. How many of you are aware of the wording of section 15169? Yeah. There is absolutely nothing, and I repeat, nothing in that section that gives the community the need or the right to collect a list of residences under this umbrella. This is a masquerade. This section relates to, and I quote, physical and biologic characteristics of the area, end quotes. It allows for inventorying, quote, air, water, supplies, existing facilities, services like hydroelectric plants, petroleum plants, some streets, water reservoirs, stuff like that. It's solely to identify and organize the environmental information. It has nothing to do with, with residents, especially old ones. Therefore, for the city to gather together a list of older residences and other structures which threaten people with the previously mentioned disastrous consequences and expenses is totally unfair. It creates the unnecessary burden for any homeowner on the current list or the potentially enlarged list. For these reasons, my wife and I respectfully request the removal of our residents from the current and or any future list if this appeal is granted, we will quietly take leave of this legal arena and continue our retirement here in Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martinson. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Persons. Uh, Trevor Martinson, architect. Uh, I think that we need to first identify that when we first started this back in the beginning of this year that I had asked HLC to verify with the city attorney's office uh, regarding this CEQA section and its applicability. Uh, since there was nothing 
mentioned in the staff recommendation executive summary i'm assuming that that was not done that being said as we know if we read and i want to put this up for the people that are watching on television the master environmental assessment one five one six nine it says nothing about the issues that were We can move it along, but it's this is a two page item. And begins that you may prepare a master environmental assessment inventory or database, all of portion of but what it says is you have to have a project first. Project first, then you may make an EIR and have that in the database. It doesn't say that you get to make a thousand or two thousand of these and include them. Seek was trying to lower the impact of so much paperwork, so much data. They want EIRs to be focused, they want them to be succinct to where if there is any impact and an EIR has to be done, it's done. That isn't the case. Now, if we go on and look at what I did, I decided, well, we better find out how many houses were actually in the city of Santa Barbara, single family residents, not including any condos, townhouses, mobile homes, or anything. It was 14,339 single family dwellings. Assuming that there are 10,000 that are of the age 50 or older, and I'm sure there are because almost all of our modifications are for old residences that we build almost a new house on. But we have a huge net over quite a few houses. Now, I think that staff is going to say, oh, no, we didn't mean that. But yes, it does, because, again, we're going back to what CEQA says. You have to have a project first. We don't have a project where city staff says, oh, we can throw a net over 10,000, 14,000 houses that then we can review. The issue that's being made here, and what I believe is the case, is that staff is trying to eliminate ministerial decisions made by the city. They want everything to be discretionary, where you can add, you can request a lot of things of property owners. I think that that's wrong. The county, for instance, they don't even think of using CEQA for their historic structures. It doesn't make any sense to them. However, their standards for selection, I think, are very good. And I'll put that up on the board for you to review. Standards of selection in designating any place, site, building structure, work of art, or other object as being of historic, aesthetic, or other special character or interest and worthy of protection under this chapter, the Historic Landmarks Advisory Commission and the Board of Supervisors shall be subject to the following express standards. And I think these are very good and very good common sense. The landmark designated shall have historic, aesthetic, or special character or interest for the general public and not be limited to interest to a special group of persons. We're talking about HLC people that would like to have this or historic consultants. Those are special interest people. We're talking about the general public. That makes sense to me. B, the designation of such landmarks shall not require the expenditure of an unreasonable amount of money to carry out the purpose of this chapter. We're talking about a lot of money for someone who comes before the various design boards here. They're going to request historic reports. These things can get into the tens of thousands of dollars. I don't think that that is a good way to go. And finally, the designation of such landmarks shall not infringe upon the right of a private owner thereof to make any and all reasonable uses of such landmark which are not in conflict 
for the purposes of the chapter. Those are common sense rules, and I think that the County of Santa Barbara did an excellent job in that area. Now, Mr. Um, yes, I just erased and didn't mean to. You've used up 15 out of the 20 minutes you and have I used 16 already? Yeah, All right. just to, just to let you know. All right, thank you. Five well, left. here's another thing, and I, I'll, I'll share a little bit of this with you. It's sort of a funny thing that happened at the DMV, but it <laughs> it is the question that you all look at and you sort of laugh at and think it's funny or maybe it isn't. But uh, it's uh, funny was funny to me because I think it's germane to what we're talking about here. Following closely behind another vehicle, which is tailgating, of course, one, increases fuel efficiency. Well, I got to go along with that. That's drafting for NASCAR, right? Is a common cause of rear end accidents. And uh, the third one helps keep traffic moving. Okay. There are two answers there that a NASCAR guy would say, hey, that's that's good, that, that's going. But the point is, there is one correct answer here. And I think in our CEQA section 15169, there is a correct answer. It's a project first. We don't say, oh, well, we can throw this net over all these people, get ourselves a lot of information on all these older houses his of historic interest. You can't do that under CEQA. It isn't permitted. You have to have a project first. And if you would allow me just a little bit more time here, I'm going to just review. There was a very interesting uh, uh, session here in Santa Barbara on legally defensible environmental review under CEQA, and it was presented by Myers and Nave, a very well-known firm. And the, app, the thing that I think is so important is applicability. They pointed out that CEQA applies only to discretionary actions, that is, actions that require judgment by the decision maker and are governed by subjective find, findings rather than objective standards. CEQA does not apply to ministerial actions. Ministerial actions require little, if any, judgment from the decision maker and most often consist of checking an application of a project against established objective standards, often by means of a checklist. Building permits are the usual example of ministerial decisions. For example, if a house plans on an existing lot comply with established setback height and other zoning standards and comply with building code standards, the applicant is usually entitled to a building permit. The local zoning ordinance, building ordinance, and other development ordinances will identify the standards necessary to qualify for a ministerial approval. We have them here. The types and ranges of ministerial approvals may vary from community to community depending on local environmental conditions and development priorities. And I think that's, that's what it should be. And the definition, here's the last thing and then I'll close, is a definition of a project under CEQA. For CEQA purposes, a project is a whole of an action which has a potential for resulting in either a direct physical change in the environment or a reasonably foreseeable indirect physical change. In order to produce a comprehensive, thorough, and accurate environmental analysis, the project description must be similarly comprehensive, thorough, and accurate. As discussed earlier in this program, the project description includes the activity or structure for which the applicant seeks approval, including related construction and improvements. The project description also includes the applications submitted for review and approval. Note that a particular activity may be a project under one statute but not another. For example, a rezoning is a project under CEQA but isn't a project under Permit Streamlining Act. A single family home on an existing lot may be a project under the local zoning ordinance but is not a project under CEQA if the approvals are ministerial. What we've done here when we started talking about the 50-year cover on everybody, they all had ministerial actions. You could go and change your roof, all of that. But one staff decided that, oh no, we have to review this now. All of a sudden, all the ministerial actions, which everyone is used to doing here, goes over to the discretionary side, which means you're going to see all of our design boards and everything that's going to be involved that cost a lot of money and time. 
For that reason, and I mean the reasons that have been given here, I think that uh, Dr. and Mrs. Clark's house should be removed from the potential list, and I think that the consul should seriously consider removing all of this 50-year designation that staff would like to include. And that was all part of being involved in the demo ordinance. And I'm for the demo ordinance. Don't get me wrong. You just added a little rider on that regarding the 50 years on all the houses here in Santa Barbara. And I think that's not fair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, the applicant, I guess, is maybe Mr. Lavoy or the HLC? Not really. No, ma'am. The Madam Mayor. Uh, that, however, they are here if, yeah, in I case know. you want to hear their opinions on, on the structure. Okay. Okay. So we'll call on them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lavoy, come first, followed by Fer Fermina um, Murray from our Landmarks Commission. Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Um, it, it, this is interesting. I prepared something to say, and now I have to think of something else to say, so okay. give me a few seconds. Um, I've always considered the potential list um, just that, a potential list. It's, it's city staff and, and the, the, you know, with the Landmarks Commission uh, advising an owner that the property that they bought has the potential of having some historic interest. Now, when we went over the list, and we went over the list as part of the implementation of the demolition ordinance, which has this 50-year language, and it, a building has to have a little bit more than 50 years under its belt to be on the potential list. We took off an awful lot of old structures because they were just old. They had no other interest. So we were looking for something else besides old. Um, and some of the houses that qualified that were perhaps more questionable than, than the one in question is uh, there was one, a, cra a, a lovely craftsman house, a wonderful example of what we, you know, fine-tuned down to being English vernacular, American craftsman, you know. It was old. It was a lovely example of what it was. And it took us 10 minutes to convince the, the owner of the house that she agreed it was a, a lovely house but didn't want to be on the list. And I think by the end of the day she said, well, I do want, it's a lovely house and I want to preserve it just the way it is. And we said, this will help you do that. The house in question, um, you know, it is 50 years old. That doesn't mean much. It's attributed to George Washington Smith. That means a lot. It's a very nice example of what he did. And yes, like most houses of 50 years old, it's been fussed with and changed and modified. But we, we accept that as part of the life of a building. That doesn't change its potential significance. And, and, and that's, that's just a courtesy on the part of staff saying, your house has the potential of being historic. It's something you should already know. Um, but it's a courtesy. It's not an imposition. It, it takes quite a bit more to impose landmark or even structure of merit status on a house. And that's not done lightly and usually not done until, as Mr. Martinson has said, you're coming forth with a proposal. We just don't go out there knocking on doors asking owners for historic structures reports. Um, you'd get pretty upset with us, I think, if we did. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it, it does take a project to bring one of these forth, but this is just a very short threshold. So I, I would ask you to um, deny the appeal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Barnwell. Could, could you give us a brief rundown on the difference or on the uh, what a property owner would run into to do an interior remodel of the kitchen? Um, that, as opposed to an exterior remodel where they change how it looks on the it outside. Would, it would be evaluated under the demolition ordinance whether it was changing a characteristic, um, a significant characteristic, and that is done at the staff level. An interior remodel um, would normally fly under the radar screen, and you would get a, a permit without much more than staff review. And mm -hmm. does this property, do you know, or maybe the, the staff know, does this property fall under the Hillside Design Guideline? It does? Yes, it would. And, it, and being a two-story, and I'm now talking about exterior remodels where you really get, that's where you really begin to interface. It, so it also is under the two-story uh, single-family design guideline board as well, right? Probably. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. For me, I'm Murray. Just thinking about what was just said. Interesting. <laughs> and then the last speaker would be Kellen DeForest. Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, I'm a historic landmarks uh, commissioner and working with Bill Lavoie and the staff, and I fully support their presentation. I also want to just add my personal comment as, uh, as a concerned citizen um, and also a practicing historian. Um, Winston Churchill once said that we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. I see potential historic resources as a major giving from the property owners. It's a giving that goes well beyond the real estate value. For 84 years, this house has contributed to that much greater unmeasured value of Santa Barbara history and character. And I would just ask you to please keep this house on the potential list of historic resources. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And we have no more speakers except for Kellen DeForest. Then. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here as a representative of the Pearl Chase Society. I am the chairman of the Preservation Committee. And you, I will read this letter which you received. Uh, but into the record. The board of the Pearl Chase Society unanimously voted to recommend to the council that the George Washington Smith Design Residence at 1849 Mission Ridge Road remain on the potential historic structures list. The society whose goal is the preservation of historic sites of significance considers this house designed by one of Santa Barbara's premier architects and in Santa Barbara's signature Spanish revival style to be especially meritorious. We respectively ask that you deny this appeal. I want to also to add that the uh, applicant uh, or the petitioner uh, brought up the county landmarks designation and which read a landmark designated shall be shall have historic aesthetic or special character or interest to th to the public. Um, I think it would be, or at least I don't know if every I don't know where the public stops, but if you if you are an architect that is famous enough and is widely as respected that he gets a whole that someone, and this happens to be Patricia Gebhardt, the daughter, I mean, not the daughter, the oh, wife of the late uh, uh, David. promoter of Santa Barbara architecture and who has a whole room named for him down at planning, that if you can get a book, like on one uh, one architect that it is certainly of interest to the whole public. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we'll go to the uh, staff. Did you have something you wanted to add? Or Madam Mr. Mayor, Lamont? we would like to clarify some statements sure. that were made, uh, and I think Mr. Jacobus has some information also that he can share. That the statement that we, uh, in 2004, when we adopted the demolition review ordinance, that we automatically required every uh, structure over 50 years old to become uh, a discretionary review process is not accurate. What you did at that time was required a sifting process, a staff assessment of any type of permit to be issued that we would actually review it to determine if major uh, historic defining character elements were being altered. And for the most part, I think we've done a very good job to try to sift through that process and allow still projects to go through min on a ministerial level. And it's been now three years from that process, and I think what we've had is feedback that these neighborhoods are being protected to the degree that some homes that have not been surveyed are protected to, to for major exterior renovations. And then secondly, the issue of the potential list. Uh, in 2004, 
you adopted that ordinance and required staff to update that list you gave us two years to do that and jake mr jacobus has worked hard and made sufficient progress to present to the land works commission his professional opinion that these structures should remain on the list and some should be removed i believe he removed 33 or presented 33 to be removed so we believe we did our work we have verified which ones belong on the list and in this case we have only one property owner that's objecting to it at this point uh so i think that speaks to i think the accuracy of the list mr jacobus okay thank you mr wiley well madam mayor i just wanted to supplement something that mr lamone mentioned because i was very much involved in the drafting and review of the demolition review ordinance in 2004 and on this point about homes that are older than 50 years old just to make sure it's real clear it's a very limited thing and it was incorrectly uh understood and that that's understandable because this is fairly complex the city established a series of survey areas to survey for his potential historic resources and we started in some of the older parts of the city of course with the logic being that that would be where our older and resources and and these surveys are to look for uh, significant homes for example that we may have missed that are really historic resources because of who uh, designed them possibly who lived in them or something that happened in connection with the home but it's only limited survey areas it's not the entire city and and the way the demolition ordinance works is if someone comes into 630 garden street with a demolition application and they say we want to demolish this home and there's a fair amount of that going on nowadays we ask ourselves, is this home located in a survey area? That's question number one. Question number two, has it been surveyed? And if it's been surveyed, we have our answer. It's either on the list or it's something significant because the surveyors identified it, or, and this is the, for the case for the most part, it's not on the list because it was surveyed and there was nothing significant. The third question then is, if, all right, it's, it hasn't been surveyed, so we really don't know much about this home. Is it older than 50 years? If it's not, they just issue the demolition permit. If it is older than 50 years, at that point we do a staff evaluation. I think it's Mr. Jacobus for the most part. <laughs> do, I think at the time we called it a, a drive-by windshield survey. Mm -hmm. well, we'll go look and we'll check our records. Is there something about this home that we're missing that we shouldn't let this home just be outright demolished? Not that we would prohibit its demolish. Uh, its demolition mm -hmm. we would rather the, the ordinance progresses to the point where a demolition of a home that is older than 50 years that the staff has identified as having some possible potential we would then say to the applicant you need to get a historic structures report and to have that reviewed by the HLC prior to demolishing your home and I, as I say it's a it's a very limited process it was designed to be very um, helpful to a homeowner and to give them answers all of that initial staff review is required to occur within 30 days of the application okay thank you mr jacobus do you have yes madam mayor members mm -hmm. of the council um first of all the, the 50 years a lot of people ask me why 50 years it seems like an arbitrary number um it's because most communities actually use 50 years as a starting point it's not a it's not a fixed number it doesn't have to be exactly 50 years of age to be considered historic. If you had a Frank Lloyd Wright house that was built in 1963, it's going to be considered historic regardless of it being short of that 50 years. 50 years was created in 1936 when they created the National Preservation Act. Um, what it was is that you didn't want to have a bunch of turn of the century or bungalows um, clogging up the system, so they said 50 years gets us back into the Victorian era, and that was the era of, of architecture. So at that point, they were taking seriously because we were losing them. At a, you know, people, they were white elephants, and people were tearing them down left and right. So that's where the 50 years comes from. There's a lot of talk in the preservation community to extend that to 75 years or, or greater, because as we get into the 50s and 60s, we're going to start having 1950s and 60s ranch houses that are 50 years of age, and we, we can't deal with them all. You know, it's quite simple. So that's where the 50 years comes from. Just to uh, touch on a couple items that Dr. Clark said. Um, we didn't assess the house as to whether it would meet the National Register standards or not, although I think it might. It does meet local standards for uh, designation as a city of Santa Barbara landmark. Also, uh, the alterations, for the most part, that were done to the house pretty much meet the Secretary of the Interior standards, which is what we look at when we evaluate. We've got a landmark house. Somebody wants to put an addition on it. Those are the standards that we look at to make a determination as to whether that addition is going to negatively impact that house or not. Those additions, I believe uh, that uh, those additions 
for the most part would have been approved if this house were already designated as a city landmark i wanted to know if that i have people call me i've had several phone calls since i've been in this position of people that said i'm looking for a george washington smith house do you know of any for sale i mean calling from another state and and uh there's several real estate agents in town that actually deal with they call themselves historic um realtors because they deal specifically with historic properties in terms of the the insurance i think that's more a factor of age i've had a number of people call me up and say my house is older than 75 years of age and my insurance companies you know cutting my insurance off what do i do uh one solution that i have that i'd like to maybe look into at some point is creating some sort of a group policy with either the community the county or the state where we can get all these people to have designated landmark properties as a benefit to them and get them some insurance that's that's affordable and, and covers them mm -hmm. and uh with that madam uh madam mayor i turn it back over to you okay thank you uh mr horton you uh, well okay um come on up Thank you. Um, in response to some of these uh, comments that were made, um, knowing Patricia Gebhardt very well, uh, the book, uh, she had a picture taken of the residence that was incorporated, in fact, several of them, including Luda Riggs' uh, sketch. In fact, when I first started the project, the first remodel project for the Clarks back in 1975, I talked extensively with Luda, and she was a great person a wonderful history of facts about the Burke sisters and we even know the families from the Burks that come to visit so we're very aware of how historic this house is it's a great house but let's not forget that we're talking about that CEQA section and I want to just review that CEQA where we have said 15169 noted two authorities Section 21083 Public Resources and Section 2103 Public Resources Code. What's important is that the legislature further found and declared that it is the policy of the state that A, local agencies integrate the requirements of this division with planning and environmental review procedures otherwise required by law or by local practice so that all these procedures to the maximum feasible extent run concurrently rather than consecutively. B, documents prepared pursuant to this division be organized and written in a manner that will be meaningful and useful to decision makers and to the public. C, environmental impact reports omit unnecessary descriptions of projects and emphasize feasible mitigation measures and feasible alternatives to projects. D, information developed in individual environmental impact reports be incorporated into a database which can be used to reduce delay and duplication and preparation of subsequent environmental impact reports. E, information developed in environmental impact reports and negative de declarations be incorporated into a database. That's what we're talking about. Each individual project adds one to the database, which may be used to make subsequent or supplemental environmental determinations. And F, the last section, all persons and public agencies involved in the environmental review process be responsible for carrying out the process in the most efficient, expeditious manner in order to conserve the available financial, governmental, physical, and social resources with the objective that these resources may be better applied toward the mitigation of actual significant effects on the environment. That's what CEQA was all about, and that's what we're talking about here. That doesn't apply to historic landmark, not that section. There may be others, but not that section. And thank you again. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Horton. I want to say that I'm the um, city council liaison to the HLC, for those that may not be aware of that. Um, from my point of view, the argument for removal of 1849 Mission Ridge Road from the potential historic structures list uh, raises from a very uh, philosophical issues. Um, also for me, um, while the arguments do address this specific house before us here, the, uh, the case that is made, um, from my view, is, is pretty generic in terms of the points 
that have been raised. I also think that if this request were to be approved uh, for removal, it would call into question one of our most important um, preservation guidelines uh, that our community has accepted for many, many years. And I, I'm just simply not willing to, uh, to put that guideline into a question by removing this house. So I'm going to be um, supporting the staff recommendation to deny the appeal. Okay. Mr. Barnwell? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding of these things is that interior remodels can, can be processed on a generally bureaucratic manner without going through a lot of discretionary review. <clears throat> it is when you begin to alter the exterior of the building that you find yourself in discretionary review. Notwithstanding this entire discussion, this house will come under discretionary review in at least two categories, one of which is the Hillside Design Guideline, and this, the other one is that it has a second floor, so it's going to come in front of the Single Family Design Guideline Board. We are, best I can tell, we're talking about placing something on a potential list. We have not designated it as a landmark at all. The references to CEQA, which you're talking about landmarks, is to a bona fide designated landmark structure, which this only has the potential of. Um, this is only anecdotal and not to be taken necessarily as part of the body of facts associated with this discussion, but <clears throat> when I heard the... Um, uh, when I heard Dr. Clark talk about the additional costs associated with house insurance, I was a little bit taken aback because, as you know, my profession is real estate appraisal, and I, I try to stay up on every component of these matters when I appraise a historic building. So I called my insurance company and just five minutes ago, my insurance company and another insurance company listed in the telephone book, and their concerns were this. Will there be tours? Is the building in good condition? Et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, no, it's only on a potential list. Both of them said, and again, this is just anecdotal, but they said there's no increase in cost associated with being put on a potential list, <clears throat> especially if there's nothing like a tour and the building is in good condition. I made a... Uh, I made a specialty out of appraising historic homes when I was down in Los Angeles for four years, including green and green homes and a lot of them like that. While I don't want to make a statement as to value, I can say that there is a vibrant market for historical buildings in the city of Santa Barbara. If they're George Washington Smith, they are, as you have mentioned, there, is, there are brokerages who specialize in historical buildings. I only say that because I'm trying to discover in my own mind if there is truly a financial hardship. And then lastly, I want to talk about that financial hardship in this way. The city of Santa Barbara is known throughout the planet as a historical town. It is our bread and butter to be a historical town. We, are, we have the first architectural board of review in the United States. Our Historic Landmarks Commission is dedicated to preserving the history of the city of Santa Barbara. Anyone who would come here and suggest that we we don't guard our history jealously would have missed what the entire town is all about. I see this as, as a relatively innocuous decision to put it on a potential list. It hasn't gone to the furtherance of landmark status. I agree with um, my esteemed counsel, Mr. Horton, uh, when he talks about the necessity of upholding all of the rules and regulations that the city has that are devoted toward preservation of its cultural and historical roots. So I am in the position now of denying the appeal. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you, Mr. House. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, not a whole lot to add to those comments except to say um, to, uh, to Dr. Clark, that's such a beautiful home, and it's mm -hmm. been a part of that neighborhood and has really truly helped establish the character of that neighborhood for so very long. And um, uh, coming down the hill there and, and, and turning where you you really see the, the house from this this angle and uh, or coming up and seeing it from the other side, even with the uh, the improvements to the, um, the the carport side and it's just it's just beautiful and it's just a very very important part of our of our um, Riviera heritage and so from a, from perhaps a, a layperson's perspective, I just have to say it's uh, it would be um, uh, really appreciate it if you would um, 
um, see the value of having this be on the potential list. And if, if at some point it were to you would see to to want to go further with that, it would be uh, likewise appreciated. And um, you know, I think also to some of the specific points that Mr. Martinson raised, uh, in this case, I think the HLC and the, the community representatives uh, who volunteer their time to serve on that represent us as the public. I mean, that's their job, to be be not just a special interest, but to be a, a, a group who has uh, interest and expertise. But they are the public, and they're standing in for the, the broader uh, um, set of constituents that we have so we really appreciate them for that and um, I think they've done a really good job in this case and lastly I'd really like to say that some of the argumentation would maybe even go against the idea of having a potentials list of, uh, and I don't I, I think I very much agree with uh, Mr. Horton and that is that that's a valuable and an important courtesy to those who are inhabiting such important dwellings and I just uh, I, w I would hate to take that away or even uh, challenge it at this point so uh, anyway thank you all for bringing the question to us but I, I will support the staff's recommendation. Okay, Ms. Schneider, and then Ms. Falcone. Well, I think Councilman Member Horton said it very well. I mean, part of what makes Santa Barbara the jewel that it is is our uh, historical heritage and, and preservation of, of homes such as this one. And, and I would, anyone, if you go into any resident who might know any architect, renowned architect in Santa Barbara, if they pick one, they'll probably pick George Washington Smith. And so not to include it as a potential historic st structure um, doesn't seem to make much sense to me. And and, uh, and I also agree with uh, Council Member Barnwell in terms of the reality of what it would take to do any any exterior uh, changes anyway. Would would You'd have to go through design review process in any case. And and that review is going to be just as strict in terms of keeping the integrity of, of the product that is there, um, whereas a, a remodel inside that doesn't have that same kind of exterior alteration will be much more reasonable in terms of getting upgrading a, a kitchen, for example, or a bathroom. So I, too, will be uh, denying the appeal. Okay, Ms. Uh, Ms. Falcone. Thank you. Um, In those years of 90, uh, 2003, 2004, um, I was the chair of the ordinance committee at that point, and I think Mr. Horton was on the ordinance committee at that point. We had many, 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 many meetings, and it took quite a long time to get the demolition ordinance approved. The discussion of is 50 years a good enough trigger, the discussion of what's significant or not, the discussion of what houses in what neighborhoods should be surveyed. All of that was gone through with a fine-tooth comb. And I know both Mr. DeForest and Mr. Lavoie were there and very, very active in the whole discussion. So all of these criteria really were vetted incredibly thoroughly. And what's amazing to me was for all of the controversy that existed back then, because it was a tremendous amount of controversy. This room was packed regularly. Um, Mr. Jacoby says that there have been virtually no complaints, that there have been a handful maybe of owners, of homeowners who have said that they object to being put on the potential list. It was described, it was set out, Mr. Horton will remember this, it was created in a way to make sure that when you're on the potential list, it is not just merely a cloaked event to getting onto the historic landmarks list, that it really is that there's potential here. And we were trying to avoid the scraping of the ground that was happening all too often or the real change in dynamic to houses without even so much as a buy your leave review. So this came into existence in order to just say, hold on, wait a sec, is there something here? And all these criteria were developed. Now in that process, we saw hundreds of examples of what qualified, what was kind of a maybe, and what really truly qualified is, yeah, there's definitely something here, and we certainly wouldn't want alterations to a home without some serious review and, and, and um, contemplation. 
I'm afraid you have one of those. You clearly have one of those beautiful, historic homes that is not designated historic. Maybe it should be, but we never do that without, well, I won't say never, but we really almost never do that without the owner's permission because there are a tremendous number of other hurdles involved with that, and that does have impacts. This level really doesn't have any impacts, and there's a long way to go before you hit that other threshold. So with all due respect, I'm going to be denying the appeal. You have an absolutely exquisite home that you've taken very good care of. We're grateful to you for that. And I don't think you'll be hurt by this designation. Mr. Horton. I move uh, denial of the appeal. Second. OK. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? OK, thank you very much. We have item number, oh, council member assignments. If we don't need to do that. We'll skip that one to next week. I just wanted to uh, make sure that the announcement of our new airline, um, uh, I was out there at the airport yesterday. Express Jet will be starting in three weeks, four weeks, I think, about uh, November 11th, and that'll be good. So um, will you go ahead and read item 15, and then we'll adjourn. Thank you. Item number 15, oh. conference with legal counsel pending litigation. Did you want to say something, Mr. Arms? Okay. <laughs> okay. We're going into closed session, and we'll adjourn out of that closed session. Thank you. There shouldn't be anything to report.